Здравейте! Добро утро! Добро утро, Марина! Как си? Супер светло! Здрасти! Здрасти, здрасти! Радвам се, че ще че успя за това нещо. Good morning, uh, everyone, and well, uh, warm welcomes to the second day of the conference, Clean Energy for People. Uh, this event uh, is um, fully in English with a Bulgarian uh, channel, and you can uh, switch uh, between the languages through the interpretation button uh, that you can see in the in the bottom Zoom menu. Uh, This event is organized by uh, Environmental Association Zazemiat, uh, Friends of the Earth Bulgaria, uh, and our partners from uh, E3G and CE Bankwatch, Bankwatch Network. Uh, we are partnering this year uh, with the Bulgarian National Radio as a media, uh, media partner. And uh, uh, this year's edition is uh, placing focus on the efforts and challenges uh, of scaling up building renovation Uh, and bringing uh, and accelerating the development of clean heating on individual and uh, district scale 
Uh, and again, as last year, uh, the heat pumps, solar thermal and district heating uh, will be uh, on the forefront. Uh, on our uh, discussions, uh, uh, of course, with uh, discussions on their potential and uh, economic viability, uh, we are also going to take a look at the European and national level policies, as well as household oriented financial instruments and uh, available programs. Uh, we have participants from across Europe. Uh, who are going to share their experience in creating affordable, scalable solutions uh, that could ensure a clean and uh, climate safe future. Uh, the conference provides experts and decision makers with a platform to discuss the challenges and the opportunities in the context of the European effort to decarbonize its building stock and heating sector. Uh, so I am now giving uh, going to give the word to Gennady if he wants to tell something, and then we're going to continue with our first presentation. Thanks, Vatoslav. Can you hear me well? Um, I just yeah, wanted perfect. to I just wanted to add that this conference um, um, uh, was the brainchild of Zazimiata a couple of years ago, and it started as a conference uh, that focuses on sustainable heating and cooling. Uh, but with the time, of course, because we're looking for much more regional approach and much more um, integrated approach, um, it started also including the topic of building renovation. Today is about the cross sections of the renovation and heating. Um, so um, we we completely uh, admit that energy saving and energy efficiency comes first, and it's the most important. Uh, but we always come to the point when we need also some active energy to be added, and this is um, of course when decarbonized heating and cooling based on renewable energy um, comes at place. Uh, so back to you uh, to present our first speaker. And welcome to Marin also on my end. Привет, Gennady. Uh, hello, Marin. I'm glad that hello. you're here. Uh, so just a um, short um, introduction. Uh, Mar Marin Marinov is, a lead, is leading the green program of uh, MoveBG uh, and uh, is a coordinator of the Green Restart Coalition. Uh, previously, he has worked as a journal, journalist and uh, media analyst. And uh, Marin is going to give us uh, some details uh, of the work of the Green Restart Coalition and the findings from uh, their latest report, uh, Mission Energy Transition. Uh, so Marin, uh, the stage is yours and uh, you have approximately half an hour. Thank you, Svetlou. In the beginning, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, of the conference uh, of uh, Zazimata, E3G and Bank Watch. Thank you and good luck to the following panels as well. As, uh, as uh, Svetlou presented me, I'm the coordinated, uh, coordinator of uh, Green Star Coalition. We've been working for three years now in MOVE uh, BG, Greenpeace Bulgaria. Um, and uh, now, um, at the invitation of the organizers, I'm going to present you energy transition mission. Uh, what is this uh, mission? We had several initiatives. The most important one is the uh, report. It's uh, called the uh, Green Topic of Energy Transition. And uh, we need to solve the five topics uh, in parallel in order for the energy transformation will get to be successful. This thematic groups are sustainable use of biomass, um, uh, fair transition of coal uh, regions, uh, transformation of uh, energy, uh, energy poverty and energy efficiency. Why did we choose these topics? Because as you know, Bulgaria, unfortunately, is uh, facing challenges uh, with regard to energy transformation. I'm going to mention data because I believe you are aware of the general picture, but Bulgaria is the country with the largest number of energy poor households, more than 27%. And these are the families uh, which uh, determine themselves that they are energy poor. Otherwise, the percentage could be even larger. The Bulgarian economy is 3.5% more energy uh, intensive versus the 
European levels, which means that the Bulgarian products are 3.5 times less energy competitive. And we uh, need to include the topic of the fair transition of Pernik, Stara Zagora and Kustendi, which are the three coal mining regions in Bulgaria. We lost uh, 200 million there because of the delay of the territorial plans. Uh, and now we uh, will probably lose 1.5 billion. Uh, we hope this doesn't happen because these are funds for reform, money against reforms uh, for these regions uh, to be reformed in order for the people to find new economic opportunities there. So we believe that uh, this uh, situation needs to be approved. This is our mission. We, all, we organized 50 Bulgarian leading experts and each uh, topic was discussed by 10 uh, NGO, uh, business uh, and other uh, experts, including journalists, uh, politologists, uh, sociologists, and representatives from the coal mining sector. Before I start the presentation on the five topics, I'm going to start with the following. Uh, there are common problems. It comes as no surprise that one of the major recommendations is to improve the communication on part of institutions because unfortunately communication is uh, not easy people are confused they don't know why do we need energy uh, transition they succumb to disinformation people find it hard to apply under different measures to do with energy efficiency the other common recommendation is the creation of a platform uh, the so-called one-stop shop on energy measures alone. As absurd as it sounds, now you can open an online shop and find different shoes and clothes, uh, sort them by size uh, and uh, model, but people are confused with regard to the energy situation in Bulgaria and there is no single energy platform presenting the information in an accessible way. Uh, which would be easy to search using different criteria. People should be able to take measures uh, on the national level, regional level, or local level, or measures to do with uh, financing, 100% uh, grants, or measures with co-financing, measures to do with energy efficiency, which is why we propose as a key reform to have an online platform, one-stop shop. And let's not forget the last word, shop, which means uh, there should be an opportunity to apply online and to buy, so to say, the energy efficiency measure with just a few clicks. Another important uh, recommendation is the utilization of the Consultative Council on the European Green Deal. This is the largest Consultative Council with regard to the green transformation in Bulgaria. It has representatives of uh, almost all stakeholders, unfortunately, uh, work has delayed there during the last few years. And furthermore, we don't have the seven subcommittees constructed, only three of them is working. So one of the main recommendations is for this council to start uh, working at maximum capacity, including through the establishment of the seven subcommittees with it. And now I'm going to turn to the presentation of the ideas. I'm going to share my presentation. I believe you should be able to see it uh, now. I just want to say something for our international guests. The, the, the amounts that you were talking about were in Bulgarian lefts. So the 200 million lost is around 100 million euro. Just to convert very quickly. Thank you, Gennady. Uh, the report communication uh, for successful energy transition is accessible on our website. Today, we will publish the report in English uh, as well. It will be accessible for the English speakers in the afternoon. Now it's only available in Bulgarian, but in the afternoon, after the end of this conference, we will upload it in English as well. The first topic is communication for successful energy transition. 
I'd like to share that uh, we in MOVE uh, BG initiated the start of this topic. The experts which got involved in the topic are leading Bulgarian journalists, including, I dare say, all the profile journalists working on the energy topic. There are only a handful of journalists working in this field. I would like to thank them for their work. They were leading uh, politologists, sociologists with huge experience and the solutions were in several regards. The first one is improving the institutional communication. This means the communication uh, among public authorities. Currently, this communication is uh, not easy to understand. There are long documents published. They are more than 100 pages long. Uh, the language is not accessible. There is poor interface between institutions. So one of the main recommendations is for this uh, communication to be understandable. Uh, the whole documents uh, should be published, but uh, they should be accompanied by summaries so that people could find it easier to understand. Another important recommendation is public communication to be horizontal and inclusive, because unfortunately, currently it is vertical, hierarchical. What does this mean? This means that we are as if in the dawn of TV and radio with one sided communication, unidirectional communication, as if the speaker doesn't want to know whether the audience understands or not. This should change. Another important uh, recommendation with regard to the public communication is the following. Every ministry and agency which are responsible for the energy transition should have a huge button with the measures uh, that each of the institutions is responsible for. And there should be a very good interface because unfortunately in Bulgaria, a large part of the ministries are with poor interface for navigation and each ministry it has a totally different uh, format of the menus, which confuses many people. I turn to the second group of solutions in the communication. They have to do with uh, the creation of the so-called national strategy for communication of the energy transition. This strategy uh, contains, uh, we have 15 recommendations on it. I'm just going to highlight some of them. The key recommendations in order to have uh, clear uh, tasks, budget and to uh, know who will implement uh, this. This should not be just another strategy with uh, unclear responsibility. We should have the people who are responsible to implement it, the deadlines, I mean, the institutions responsible, and what are the goals to achieve. Uh, the idea is uh, to do this on an annual basis because energy transition is something that is happening all the time. It is an ongoing process and something that was written last year would not be valid today and would not be updated today. And another key aspect of communication is to address directly the fears of people because people are afraid for their jobs. Uh, they're afraid of the prices and public institutions and the government mostly central government have to communicate in a very clear way why this transition is necessary what will be the health benefits the benefits to business to industry and of course the benefits to other household budgets it has to be clearly stated that when we start using cleaner energy uh, households and families will have more money uh, they'll have more money to spend on themselves, on their children, on their education. This has to be stated very clearly. The other set of recommendations has to do with uh, communication of NGOs and uh, the academia. And this again has to do with uh, more targeted communication to the people. We shouldn't be speaking amongst each other. We should be talking to the people in a way which is easy to understand. Because unfortunately, sometimes we, the NGO sector, uh, also sometimes use very complicated uh, language, which is difficult for people to understand. And the last recommendation has to do with journalists and their role in the communication process. And one of the main recommendations is to give more time to journalists to prepare on the subject related to the energy transition. Uh, we can greatly um, benefit from the support of uh, journalists in Bulgaria, but unfortunately, um, the relevant desks are quite small 
and many journalists have to handle a variety of completely different issues. It's different for them to become experts uh, on this very complex but very important issue. And uh, we would like to appeal to those in charge to let journalists have more time to get acquainted with this. And it's very important because there's a lot of funding and journalists should be able to participate in the monitoring and making sure that funding is duly spent. So it's very important to have training of journalists from the relevant faculty at universities together with associations of journalists without the participation of the state because whenever um, the state is uh, involved, uh, it will um, raise some issues regarding uh, sensitivity, impartiality, and interference by the state, etc. And now I will go on to the second part of my presentation. It has to do with Pernik, Kuznedu, and Starazagora. These are the three main coal mining regions and their fair uh, and equitable transaction. And one of the main recommendations is to make analysis of the different areas and see what the challenges are in the different municipalities related to the fair equitable transition. Why are there delays, for example, in Pobuto? Why are there problems but not uh, in Stara Zagora? What's happening on local level? What's making things difficult? The other recommendation is to um, develop a national roadmap with specific uh, deadlines for the gradual uh, phasing out of coal year by year uh, and well, they should take into account um, targets for creating new jobs and other um, economic measures. It's very important to have a specific um, deadlines, responsible authorities and uh, breakdown of the deadlines by years. Another important recommendation to draw up an economic analysis of the potential of those three coal mining regions in cooperation in conjunction with neighboring regions. This is very important in terms of uh, what is being done in the field of rural development, having connectivity, uh, connections, interaction between the uh, neighboring regions. This is why we think Pernik, Starazagor and Kustendil should look into the possibilities of connecting with existing economic potential in neighboring regions in order to um, have synergies. Another important thing is to have um, trainings to enhance skills or to acquire new skills, but not training for training's sake, uh, to really work with uh, trade unions with employers and have everyone get together and organize a practical targeted training based on an analysis what kind of jobs will be um, wanted in that particular area so that uh, these people working in the cold inter coal industry could be retrained into those um, areas where there's going to be more demand. Um, my colleagues and I uh, worked on um, mapping out a number of measures to alleviate energy poverty, which is, as you know, deeply related to issues that have to do with energy transition. Thank you very much to my colleagues uh, who work together with me. There are about 12 recommendations in this field, so I'm just going to mention a few. And so they are mostly related to the need to draw up an integrated roadmap uh, covering the period up to 2030 in order to alleviate energy poverty again uh, with responsible authorities, budget and uh, time frames, deadlines and control mechanisms. Another very important recommendation is to have a competent uh, public authority um, designated by the Council of Ministers that will be uh, specifically responsible for um, taking charge of issues to uh, alleviate energy poverty. Uh, now we have different uh, um, authorities, including the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy, the Ministry of uh, Energy and others. Uh, so responsibilities are split and uh, better interaction is needed. Um, it doesn't matter which one it is, but somebody needs to coordinate policy in this field. 
And uh, another important uh, recommendation is to uh, conduct regular public evaluations of measures taken to uh, um, counteract uh, energy poverty. And this needs to be reported regularly and publicly. This problem is unfortunately getting worse, so we think it should receive due attention. It should be done on a quarterly uh, basis in accordance with um, specific uh, mechanisms uh, following the Green Deal. This has to be, as we said, uh, uh, this information has to be publicly available uh, online. And the next subject has, uh, of our report has to do with energy communities. It's uh, very much connected with the previous topic because many of the measures to address energy poverty uh, could be uh, closely linked with the creation of uh, energy communities. What do we mean when we say this? Um, this panel uh, was organized by our uh, colleagues from different NGOs uh, with the participation of the only energy community in Bulgaria, also uh, representatives of banks, academia, NGOs. This was the biggest working group. And we hope that very soon we will see practical results on this subject. Uh, currently, as I said, there is just one in Greece. Uh, there is around 160 there are around 160 so we're quite far behind and you know this is one of the main pillars in the european policies geared towards successful energy transition again i'm going to present only a few of the recommendations it's not surprising that most of them uh, are looking to the new national assembly uh, because Bulgaria has not yet transposed the Renewable Energy Directive, and so uh, these um, communities are not yet part of our national legislation. Uh, the directive should have been transposed by um, 2021. About a month ago, we presented the uh, Energy Transition Report before the National Assembly, uh, with the participation of uh, the four biggest parties in Bulgaria, and everybody agreed and promised uh, they would work as quickly as possible in order to transpose the directive, and we hope this will indeed happen. I hope it just wasn't a uh, promise before the elections, uh, because it was in fact three days before the elections. The key issue uh, when this directive is transposed is to introduce the non-discriminating uh, conditions so that we can have a really, truly functioning mechanism. You know, the directive uh, says this this has to happen, but it's up to Bulgarian legislator to decide how this is going to happen in practice. Another key aspect as regards uh, energy communities is to adopt adequate measures in order to prevent them from being monopolized. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, if one building creates an energy uh, community with uh, 15 members, a big energy company could go to them and gradually buy them out. We want to stop this from happening uh, because this would um, make them useless, in fact, and we'll see a similar situation to what happened in the field of agriculture. Instead of uh, many small farms uh, being created and thriving, we had only a few big players who um, uh, monopolize the sector. And last one, has, uh, last topic has to do with sustainable use of biomass. You know, in Bulgaria, uh, usually people, uh, when they talk about biomass, think about the unpleasant situation we had a few years back. And uh, unfortunately, there's quite a, a lot of um, people who still burn firewood during the winter. It's a very complicated topic. I'm not going to go into detail. But the recommendations given by experts were grouped into five main groups. I'm going to just tell you about those groups and some of the ideas. So these groups cover the most important topics, biomass, according to our experts. This has to do uh, with considering biomass energy as renewable 
uh, energy using biomass in industrial installations and uh, also the expected changes in the field of energy and climate, sustainable use of biomass by households, and finding alternatives to biomass. Just a few words concerning the recommendations in those five thematic areas. Uh, one recommendation is not to rely on burning firewoods in order to meet Bulgaria's objectives. Very often Bulgaria is saying that we're doing very well in this respect, in meeting the targets and indicators, but we're not asking ourselves how uh, do we come to those results. You know that biomass will not be considered a renewable energy source in the future, so we have to start uh, taking steps. Uh, also, um, another target is not to allow um, coal plants to be transformed into uh, biomass and waste installations, and also not to allow for uh, large percentage targets of uh, biomass uh, use, and to find funding for in order to find alternatives to biomass. This is it more or less. This is what uh, the report contains very, very briefly. Uh, we have uh, over 150 findings and recommendations. It is already available in Bulgarian. It will be available in English very soon. And I would also like to invite all of you on the 15th of May at 6.30 in Mobiji uh, to join us for the anniversary of um, uh, Green Restart together with our colleagues. Uh, the event will be called Restart Bulgaria, called Green. It is an innovative uh, forum. It will give us an opportunity to discuss a number of very important issues. Uh, 15th of May, uh, 6.30 p.m. Mobiji. I hope to see you there, and I hope that all the other panels will be um, also focused on this issue and we'll hear a lot of uh, very interesting solutions and see how these practices can be implemented, because this is why we're here. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation, Marina. We have uh, only one question from those registered uh, users in uh, Zoom. Let me remind you that we are gathering all the questions. You can ask them in YouTube or from the live stream and uh, in Facebook where we are casting it on the web page of the Zemiata. The question from the Zoom uh, attendee is, are there good practices uh, uh, from the EU countries with regard to the introduction of uh, the suggested one-stop shop on energy efficiency suggested by Mr. Marinov. I can answer that uh, uh, two countries were mentioned. I can't remember. Maybe one of these was Germany. The report mentions two other countries uh, with uh, similar one-stop shops on the national level regarding the energy efficiency. Okay, thank you, Gennady. A quick uh, context for our international guests. Thanks to the use of firewood for heating, Bulgaria is managing to be a regional leader, including with regard to its uh, RES targets, with 43% as uh, 2030. Only Greece has such a high uh, target as Bulgaria for heating and cooling. Bulgaria is a European champion as regards clean uh, frequent elections because on the in April we had the fifth uh, elections in two years uh, which uh, did not resolve uh, the uh, 
political note and uh, soon we may have six elections a quick note to marine i'm not sure that i heard another fear uh, which is mentioned as regards energy transitions in our region that the funds uh, from the european union are destined uh, to fall into the hands of local feudals people are afraid of this and uh, this uh, paralyzes people to take concrete steps maybe i'm to blame but i didn't give the feedback uh, about the report but now that uh, marina presented uh, the highlights from the report uh, item by item i i believe that we shouldn't uh, avoid this topic we should uh, voice it Yes, just an interjection from me. This is one of the main issues, uh, the one that you mentioned. So even if there are measures on these in the report, uh, I said that uh, I didn't mention all the measures, including the organization of local committees, including the uh, academia, in order to make sure that the local feudals, often with uh, links to the mayors, uh, will not... Uh, uh, have a negative effect on what is uh, sought after. Uh, thank you, thank you again, uh, Marin. I don't see any other questions, uh, so we can uh, we can continue with uh, with the next presentation. Uh, Monica, yes, I hope that you're here. Uh, so just a brief uh, uh, brief introduction. Uh, Monica Vidal is uh, hitting uh, campaign coordinator at uh, Climate Action Network, Can uh, Europe, uh, where uh, her main objective is to develop and implement and coordinate a uh, European-wide campaign uh, to foster the, the, the decarbonization of uh, buildings, uh, the heating systems, especially in the buildings, and to scale up relevant, sustainable, renewable solutions uh, uh, across Europe. Uh, before joining uh, Ken Europe, she worked uh, for 12 years uh, at uh, ECODES, uh, a Spanish environmental organization, as uh, director of public policy and uh, climate uh, governance. Uh, and uh, today, Monica is going to um, tell us a bit about uh, the latest report of uh, Ken Europe uh, on uh, embracing a renewable heating revolution in our buildings. Uh, so, Monica, now uh, the stage is yours, and you will have roughly uh, 30 minutes, including the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Svetoslav. Uh, before, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, okay? perfect. Yeah, okay. Thank you, because uh, I'm so sorry, but uh, my computer was broken yesterday, so I borrowed just one today for the to participate in the conference, so uh, I hope that everything will work. Uh, so I will share my presentation, if that's okay. okay can you see my presentation? Full yes. screen, all works well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for, for having me today. So uh, as uh, Svetoslav uh, was saying before, I'm uh, Monica Vidal. I'm the heating campaign coordinator at Can Europe. And uh, today for me, uh, the, the idea is to share with you the, the last, uh, the, the latest report that we present, uh, we launched uh, in February about the re uh, renewable heating solution. But before I start with the, with the report, I just want to say a few words about CAN Europe. What is CAN Europe? CAN Europe is a network of NGOs. Today we have like more than 200 members organization active in more than 38 uh, European countries. And um, what uh, we are mainly doing is promoting uh, lobby campaigns on advocacy work around these countries and uh, we, what we promote is the sustainable climate and energy and development policies uh, around Europe. So in this context, uh, we uh, initiate a new campaign in 2021, is the renewable heating campaign that we call uh, Warm Homes for All. 
And this initiative uh, of Can Europe uh, Network is to promote sustainable renewable heating solutions for all homes across Europe. This is a solution-oriented campaign. We co-create this campaign with our members and uh, with uh, working closely with our partners. And uh, the idea is to support the change at national level to fully decarbonize uh, the heating sector based on energy efficiency and renewables. So the campaign uh, at national level, the idea is to raise the uh, awareness and to strengthen the public discourse on the importance of moving away from fossil fuels and inefficient system. And uh, our idea is to develop this campaign like as a pan-European campaign. So we will facilitate and support the participation of European NGOs from countries also outside of the European Union. So now that as uh, just as, a, as a, the background that we developed, we initiated this campaign uh, two years ago almost. And now what we did uh, this year in February 2033 was to, to launch this new report, the Embracing a, Re a Renewable Heating Revolution in Our Buildings. Um, what we did uh, to, to elaborate this uh, report, we did in collaboration with our members. So uh, they included a lot of inputs to add the national context also about these barriers. And because um, our main idea, because you know that heating decarbonization has gained enormous attention from experts, but also for the politicians in recent times. But on the ground, the progress is more slow and uh, we can find many obstacles uh, to succeed in the implementation of this uh, renewable heating uh, solution. And, um, and even the most motivated, motivated citizens uh, can, can feel the, 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 the difficulties to, to implement this new uh, uh, solution. So the objectives of the report was to explore in detail these barriers and add in this national context, as I said, provide examples and also hint at possible solutions to accelerate the deployment of renewable heating solutions across Europe. Later in the chat, I can share the, the link to the report, so you can, you can have a look, because also uh, we have the uh, Bulgarian version of the report. So we launched the report in February. Uh, we disseminate at EU level, but also at national level. You can see here the we elaborate some fact sheets, and of course, we disseminate it in all social media. Uh, the, the report was very well received, and uh, the dissemination uh, was uh, was good, but also uh, we are very happy that our members were, uh, they found it useful and they uh, they used it at national level, the, the trans they translate the, the, the fact sheet, the, they use the information to use it in the national, uh, in the national website, so you can see our colleagues from, from Spain, our colleagues from Portugal, our colleagues from Denmark, they disseminate the, the information of the report as well. So that's the objectives of the campaign. So we were, we are very happy about this. And also, for, as I mentioned, uh, the full uh, report is uh, translated in Bulgaria, Pesta, and uh, they disseminate the report in this month in April, if I remember correctly. But maybe later, Svetislav can can say a word about the dissemination in, in the country. Um, but uh, as we said, uh, that was the main purpose of the campaign to support the work of our members at national level. So we are happy to see these initiatives uh, at national level also. So now maybe I can say um, maybe some uh, some pieces of what uh, we, you can find in the in the report. As I said, the idea of the report is to explore uh, the barriers, but also the solutions. Uh, to deploy the renewable heating solution across Europe. So we divided these barriers uh, mainly in three blocks, uh, barriers related with the users, the demand side, barriers related with the industry, the supply side, and barriers related with the political side. Uh, and also included, of course, some conclusions and key recommendations. So as I said, the, the idea the, is to, to provide some, an overview of the economic, but also the non-economic barriers that exist on both the demand and the supply side when it comes to renewable heating solutions, and also to include that this uh, solution for, for these, to tackle these barriers. 
and and how how we can over, uh, overcome these barriers at uh, European level. So what I I propose to uh, that I can do is to um, of course you can you can have a look to the to the report to to see in details of these uh, barriers and the solutions and the, the recommendations that we propose to tackle these barriers. But today I can focus in in one uh, barrier per, per per block. So for example for the user and the demand side, I can I can uh, speak more about the upfront cost. From the industry side, I can uh, speak more about the lack of skilled workers. And the political side, I can talk more about the, the lack of clear objectives. So about the upfront cost, um, you know that the, uh, when maybe it's important also to mention that uh, for the campaign, um, we are promoting the um, individual heating solutions, so as uh, heat pumps and uh, solar thermal, but also, of course, the connection of renewables district heating. But it's true that in the um, in the campaign and maybe in the in the in the report, you will find more reference to individual heating solutions as heat pump and solar thermal. But we are not. Uh, avoiding the, the the work on district heating, but we know that this is more a complex uh, solution. We need other uh, strategies, and uh, we will need to focus more uh, in the future on these uh, on these solutions with more specific uh, work. So just to, to let you know, in the report you will find that more reference to individual heating solution, so heat pumps and cooler thermal. And um, in relation with that, heat pump, for example, consumes several times less energy than gas boilers. Uh, so, and therefore, the, the operating costs are typically smaller. But in, and if you decide to insulate your buildings or to replace already just with low temperature ones or underfloor heating, or even becoming a flexible consumer, uh, you will reduce also the operational cost. But in relation with the upfront cost, uh, the cost is, is there and is uh, is very high nowadays. Uh, either is 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 higher than a gas boiler. So the recommendations to tackle this upfront cost is easy. We need this financial support uh, to overcome these uh, these barriers, especially for vulnerable families, for low income families, and uh, we need these subsidies and rebates and so all all the. Um, all the alternatives that we have to reduce the operational costs, for example, the heat as a service on bill financing. So they have all uh, a role to play uh, to reduce this economic friction to switch to renewable heating, electrification and demand side flexibility should be also considered. We also consider that the next uh, generation new funds, there are uh, the, the, uh, a great opportunity to finance the transformation of our buildings. So, because we what we are pushing for is to 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 perform holistic renovations that look at the thermal insulation of buildings, but combine it with the with the with the massive implementation and deployment of renewable heating solutions, um, and of course. Primarily targeting the, the worst performing buildings. So for us, it's important. It's not only about heat pumps, installing heat pumps, but also to reduce the demand on our buildings. So that's why we are pushing for this holistic uh, renovation, tackling tackling both the, the 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 demand side of buildings and also the um, the operational parts of building. Then in the second block. Uh, I can focus on the on the lack of skilled workers because uh, despite the rest of the barriers that, that we identified in the report, it's true that the the demand of the installation of renewable heating solution, especially in some countries, has increased a lot. But and sometimes the supply is finding uh, difficulties to to follow this uh, this um, this demand. So one of the reasons for that is the, the shortfall of qualified workers, and not just in the heating industry, but in general across the, the construction sector. And uh, one of the problems that, uh, that we, we, we all identified is that blue-collar jobs are perceived as hard and poorly paid, and they do not always get enough social recognition. 
and uh, so the problem is uh, compounded even more in some countries that uh, the wages are low overall and workers may move abroad in search of better and means and labor conditions. Um, there is a consensus that uh, that many of the skills needed to manufacture boilers can be transferred to manufacture the heat pumps or uh, to install it. But of course, we will need to uh, additional trainings, for example, in order to to use the the refrigerants that the, the heat pump uses, and even if we are uh, we are pushing for the use of natural refrigerant in these heat pumps, for example, so that they will need additional trainings. So the recommendation boldly that we included in the report is that governments, both governments and manufacturers need to work together um, in this communication towards um, training and uh, um, to, to, to have more installers ready to install real skills and solutions because they, they need to know about this solution in order to recommend these solutions. And um, also, of course, a um, very important part is to, to join forces to ensure good working conditions, better, better safety conditions and wages, and improve the qualification requirements. And uh, so they, we need, they need to roll out large-scale education initiative in, to ensure that the sufficient supply uh, adequately qualified and certified workers deliver high quality work. In relation with this barrier, uh, we together, um, together with uh, some partners, can, you know, we are organizing a, an event, a, a session during the European Sustainable Energy Week. So as soon as the weekend the, in, that, will, that will happen in June, the 21st of June, if I remember correctly, so as soon as we have the information ready to share, I will share with the with the with the, with Sassiniata. Maybe they can uh, share the information with with all of you if you want to to follow this discussion as well. And um, in the third block, in the political in the political side, uh, we can maybe talk about the the lack of clear objectives because. Um, even if we, we have seen the, a clear shift of priorities, both at EU and national level, in favor of more uh, immediate energy savings and faster decarbonization of all energy use uh, sectors. Um, until now, this did not particularly help to shift the tension to structural and long term measures beyond this winter. What I want to, what that means is that. Um, if uh, okay, if we we have seen some initiatives to really push for short-term measures, for example, the installation of heat pumps installation, or maybe uh, lowering term, term, thermostat or turning off unnecessary lighting, etc. But these short-term measures need to pave the way also to the long-term measure, for example, a sleep term renovation, to really achieve the long-term savings that we need in our buildings. So for us, the recommendation will be to, to really provide clear objectives for, for keeping the carbonization, but also for, for building the carbonization in general and uh, um, taking the, the inspiration from countries that already included and uh, have done something similar on that. These objectives will take different forms. It could be uh, a date uh, end by the which all heat needs to be decarbonized, uh, an ambition target rate for the renovations, uh, also obligations to start renewable technologies or to connect to renewable district heating networks when replacing a boiler, etc. So there are many um, alternatives uh, to, to include these clear objectives, and these objectives really will help us to to clear the expectations for all the stakeholders and simplify the task of relying them around the common decarbonization goal. So this is the first step that, that we need to, to design, calibrate and align all other policies and financial incentives. And um, that, uh, that will be, the, of course, one of the, the most important part that we highlighted in the report and uh, because we need this, uh, these clear objectives to to really to to, to foster and the, the the deployment of renewable heat solutions. 
to about some conclusions. Uh, buildings heat in decarbonization has been so far the elephant in the room, but it's uh, the moment is, is now, time is now, we cannot look a uh, longer way. Um, the, the energy price, uh, fossil energy price has raised a lot, and uh, this is hitting people very hard, uh, especially the most vulnerable, so we need uh, immediate action and to reduce our over dependence on fossil fuels, protect also people, and uh, of course achieve uh, energy security and of course tackling climate change. So we need this political will that we were mentioned, we need these clear objectives because we need really now heat in our homes um, uh, that uh, in more in a, in a different way. We need uh, to transform our buildings, we need to that our, um, we need to hit our homes the, in a renewable way, accessible, efficient, and also affordable for all, because this uh, will imply positive impacts on every, every day for, for us. And um, we need our buildings to make them more comfortable, safe, and healthy. So thank you very much for, for your attention. You, you see here my, my email address, so please don't hesitate to, to contact me if you want to know more about the report or also about the, about the initiative. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Monica. Um, yeah, we have uh, we have a couple of a uh, couple of questions that we uh, would like to to ask you. But first, I would really like to stress out that we have the report published uh, on Zazemiata's website in Bulgarian, so you could just uh, uh, very uh, very easily uh, find it uh, over there. And now to the now to the questions. Uh, something um, that our viewers want to. Uh, I uh, want to know is, uh, are there any geographical differences uh, that you can highlight in terms of the problems and solution? Problems and solutions between the different countries. Are the problems the same uh, in uh, all the countries and are the solutions the same uh, to ensure clean heating on um, individual level as a household? Thank you, Svetozla. Of course, there are many. Um, for example, the, the first thing is uh, which uh, we are not hitting our homes in the same way in, in all the in all the countries in, in, uh, in Europe. For example, in some <clears throat> in some countries, gas boilers are more frequent in other it's um, district heating. So the the solutions that we need will be different. And um, and for example, for for both the individual heating solution and also the collective heating solutions, um, there is it's very important to have these local heat and cooling plans that now uh, apparently will be more easily implemented. But especially for district heating, I consider that these this, these plans are essential because if not the the solution to to really have this district heating connected to renewable sources are uh, very much more difficult to, to implement. So that's, of course, that's the main difference, the, the how we heat our homes and the, with which technologies, but also all the differences. For example, in, in, the, in countries like in Spain, for example, um, I think it's like 80% of the people live in a multi apartment buildings. Uh, and for example, this uh, situation is completely different in other countries that the people live more in uh, individual houses. So for example, these solutions uh, and the barriers are different. So in these, these multi-apartment buildings, uh, one of the main barriers is that uh, there is no space uh, or it's more difficult to install these uh, heat pumps. Uh, so for example, we need to, to find uh, different solutions. We need to install these heat pumps in the in the rooftop or maybe in the in other areas um, and also even even more important in these uh, multi-apartment buildings the the renovation the listic renovation is harder to implement because for example in countries like 
here in, in Spain that you need to, all the neighbors in the, in the multi apartment buildings need to be all agree on the implementation of this building for innovation. So it's more, yeah, there are different barriers. And uh, for example, nowadays we tackle these barriers. We now it's a little bit different. So we can, it's even, but anyway, um, so I understand that this need a more, not only a, a building approach, but even more a district approach to, to implement these barriers. So that's uh, that's important to, to take in, in consideration. We are when also when we are um, developing this uh, policy at EU level to understand that uh, it's not the same situation uh, around in all over countries. And for example, about the renewables, if we are considering that okay, if we are producing, uh, we are installing PV panels to to that uh, and uh, this renewable electricity can can be used to, to run these heat pumps. Uh, we need to consider, for example, in these multi apartment buildings that we don't have enough uh, rooftop space uh, to, to, to deliver renewable electricity for all the, mem for all the people that live in these in this buildings. So we need to promote other solutions. And for example, this project that promotes um, the energy sharing, energy community, but in the in the neighborhood like we for example you can install these pv panels in public buildings and that are in your neighborhood for example but you can and you can be part of this project we need this kind of solutions and when we are talking about this very uh high um, high i don't know and that in this neighborhood that uh, there are all, all only about uh, multi-apartment buildings because if not uh, it will be impossible and uh, just uh, one more quick question uh, from my side that I can see. And now I'm going to give uh, uh, the, the floor to Gennady. And uh, there is one uh, specific, uh, a little bit specific question maybe, but what is the role of um, the municipal decision makers on making this renewable heating a reality? What a municipality could do in order to um, uh, to help this transition to renewable heating? Well, for me, as I said, for me, it's very, the, the role of these heat, uh, heat and cooling plants is very important in the deployment of renewable heating solution. So these need to be uh, implemented at local level. So I think the importance of municipalities to implementing these plants are essential. And also implement this also, this these uh, energy sharing projects, these energy communities also, I think that they have a very important role to play. Um, and um, it's very important that, that in developing this local heating plan also include uh, in the conversation uh, all the different stakeholders uh, that, are, uh, that are working also at, at, at local level already. And for example, if we are, um, this is especially important if we want to, to tackle, so the idea is to tackle also the problems of energy poverty. So we need to, to include in this discussion also the, the organization that are already working with this population, with, uh, with the vulnerable families, because they know uh, what they need, they know their barriers, and they know how we can engage uh, these groups in the, in the discussions. And also, we need to engage with the with the with the with the companies that they are providing also the renewable sources, and also to integrate the the energy sources in the in the in the, in the energy heat, uh, heating and cooling plants. Yeah, thank you. So I see the role of the municipality as a focal point to gather a lot of different actors together. Uh, and uh, Gennady. Monica, thank you for leading this well-structured campaign, and I'm so happy that Kenya Europe is really mainstreaming the heating topic already. Um, it's, it was high time, and and uh, it's super important, and I'm happy to see the progress. Um, I just want to add a few things because I think your presentation is the right moment too, not necessarily super connected to it, but 
but still within the topic. Uh, one is that when we talk about the development of skills and the lack of skills, I think it's also um, important to flip on the on the other side of the coin, and it's about improving labor productivity. And it's not about people working longer hours or working really super hard. It's about also industry, for example, uh, trying to uh, make more plug-and-play solutions so that uh, installation co uh, installation costs and hours really um, decrease down. Um, another thing that I heard recently um, is something promoted in the Netherlands um, by um, uh, Technic Netherlands, an expert from Technic Netherlands, is that they started promoting hybrid solutions when it comes to electrification and um, and heat pumps. Uh, which means that they don't install oversized heat pumps, especially in buildings that still haven't had an ambitious renovation and energy efficiency improvement on their envelope. But they still allow the systems to work together with the old, in the case of Netherlands, gas boilers. But here around CE, I guess this would be also the, the old biomass boilers. So a lot less fuel for heating, maybe just in the deep winter, um, it would be necessary to, to switch on the old systems or to keep them as backups, and still the heat pumps can operate. And once the energy efficiency measures are there, because they might have been taken step by step, for example, first the glazing, then the, then the, uh, the building insulation, et cetera, um, this, heat pump, this heat pump would then probably be absolutely sufficient uh, for the needs uh, of a given household. Um, I think that the most important in this process is maybe that we should not always aim to, you know, immediately looking for 100% renewable energy in the um, uh, in the heating if we can't afford if we can't afford it in a cost efficient um, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, um, um, doable way uh, but still the horizon that we implement those projects with to prevent lock-ins so we should be able to upgrade with the time. Okay, yeah, if, if I may, um, yeah, I, we have um, members working in the Netherlands and uh, about uh, heating and uh, they are also um, the people that they were promoting a, a coalition with together with manufacturers and installers in the Netherlands and uh, they are very focused on hybrid heat pumps, uh, as you mentioned. So, um, as uh, our position is like, okay, we know in the way in the in the in the in the transition, we will uh, we will find these uh, these solutions. But uh, we need to be really um, aware also about the cost because if we have a hybrid system, also the maintenance you you will need to to also you have the, 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 the cost of the maintenance of the gas boiler, so biomass boiler and also the heat pump. So you need to, to, to make these numbers uh, also to understand uh, uh, about really the, the sufficiency of this solution. And also the, one of the most important things that uh, we, we, we are worried uh, about promoting the hybrid heat, uh, heat pump is the, the locking effect that you mentioned already. So, uh, okay, this will be transitional or will be at the end uh, the final solution. That's uh, the, the only the, 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 the thing that worries us. But we understand that in the way to, to, to the 100 uh, real solution, we will find these solutions implemented as well. But uh, we are worried about the locking effect, of course. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Monica, for this presentation. I don't see any other uh, questions um, to you right now. So um, thank you for the presentation one more time. And now we are continuing with our next presenter. Uh, and uh, this presenter is Sam. He is uh, already already here. Just a quick introduction. Um, uh, Sam uses his broad knowledge of uh, EU energy and buildings policy to support uh, regulatory assistance project uh, work on um, energy efficiency and clean heating. So we are going to continue the topic of clean heating a little bit. And he has a specific uh, interest in building decarbonization, district heating and heat planning. And before joining uh, RAP, uh, uh, Sam worked for, for RESCOP EU. 
uh, especially on energy energy communities. Uh, and now uh, we're going to speak a little bit about how to make buildings uh, um, low flow temperature ready. Uh, and uh, I think that this is a very important topic and uh, a very timely topic. Uh, so Sam, I'm, I'm giving you um, the stage right now and you're going to have approximately half an hour including the Q&A session. So uh, thank you and uh, it's your turn. Yes, thank you Svetoslav. Um, let me share my screen. All right. So I hope you can all see my presentation now. I can't see you anymore, so. Um, yes, we can see it. Great. Well, thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, so I would like to discuss with you today the concept of uh, low flow temperatures in heating. Uh, this is an important part of driving energy efficiency and also the uptake of renewable energy in buildings. Um, and really look at how we can ensure buildings are made ready to be heated comfortably with lower temperatures. Um, and yeah, I think as Svetoslav already said, this topic fits in very well also with Monica's presentation, just delving a bit deeper into one specific aspect of, of making clean heating work in buildings. Um, and this presentation is based on a study that will come out before summer um, that we at RAP are writing together with uh, a German research institute called IFE. Um, and as this is a relatively new topic, um, I will try and keep my presentation short so we have some time left for questions and also discussion, because I would be really keen to know how you see the applicability of this concept in your countries and regions. So maybe before we get started, uh, what are we really talking about when we talk about flow temperature? So we are not talking about the thermostat temperature, so the temperature in the room. Um, we are really talking about the temperature uh, of the water in the pipes in the heating system. So most heating systems in Europe use hot water flowing from a boiler um, generator or coming through a, a substation, in the case of a district heating system, through pipes uh, to emitters, so the radiator or in maybe very um, new or deeply renovated buildings, underfloor heating. Um, and the temperature of the water that flows from the boiler to the emitters is what we call the flow temperature. Uh, so this is the water used to transfer uh, the heat to the room. Um, and then on the other hand, the when the water flows back from the emitter or the radiator to the boiler to be reheated, we call that the return temperature. So why is this important? Um, when we are heating our homes right now, we often uh, comb combust the fuel. So it could be oil, biomass, or gas. And so we're generating heat at over well 100 degrees centigrade. Um, and this is extremely inefficient, um, as this is all just to get our room to 20 degrees. Um, so right now, most flow temperatures uh, will generally be between 70 and 80 degrees in, a, for example, a, a condensing gas uh, boiler or oil boiler. And in many district heating systems, temperatures are actually even higher, so maybe even 90 to 120 degrees Celsius. And so if we bring down these temperatures, um, we can really get a lot of efficiency gains already for all the existing boilers we have. So already for fossil fuel based boilers, lowering the flow temperature really improves the efficiency. Um, so, for example, many people that are running their boiler at uh, factory settings, which is maybe 80 um, degrees centigrade flow temperature and a 60 degrees return temperature, their boilers will not even condense, um, even though the whole sort of efficiency, the, the nameplate efficiency of the boiler was based on that these boilers can condense. Um, so meaning that they can recover some of the heat uh, coming from the flue gases. And so the lower the flow temperature, the more efficient a condensing boiler will be. So for example, if we can, as we can see also on this graph, um, really a boiler only starts to condense when the temperature the return temperature reaches around 55 degrees. 
Um, and of course, you can imagine the lower the flow temperature, the easier you will also get the lower return temperature. And a flow temperature of around 50 degrees for your gas boiler is suggested to get it over a 90% efficiency. Um, so lowering flow temperatures is already important just to drive efficiency uh, in heating systems that use uh, condensation recovery. But maybe the biggest importance of lowering flow temperatures is because it really enables the efficient use of excess and ambient heat. And we have this huge potential of uh, excess heat coming from industry or cooling processes, um, but also ambient heat coming from geothermal and solar thermal and um, surface water or groundwater. But we can only really make efficient use of this uh, if we run our heating systems at lower flow temperatures. And that is because most of these sources themselves are of lower temperatures. And um, of course, you could upgrade these temperatures using traditional boilers or heat pumps, but then of course you will have to invest extra energy so that makes it less efficient. Um, to give you an example of this, heat pumps um, which make use of ambient heat in the example uh, I have here, for example, you see on the left is an uh, air to water heat pump, so it uses the ambient heat uh, present in the air. Um, but this could also be from the ground, surface water, or even geothermal. So heat pumps also run much more efficiently at lower temperatures. As you can see in this graph, which is results from uh, field tests of heat pumps, um, with gray being air to water heat pumps and green being, um, uh, sorry, being gray being water, water heat pumps and uh, uh, green being um, air to water heat pumps. You can see that as the flow temperature goes down, the efficiency of the heat pump goes up. So the amount uh, of heat generated for each unit of electricity goes up as the temperature goes down. But the same actually applies to district heating systems. So they greatly benefit from reducing flow temperatures. So in our study, we looked at a small district heating system in uh, Southern Germany, where they are currently uh, bringing down the temperature to below 60 degrees on the coldest days. Um, and as you can see, this really uh, improves their efficiency. So it, on the one end, it improves their uh, yield from uh, sustainable sources such as solar thermal, uh, but it also really reduces the consum electricity consumption of the heat pumps in the in the district heating system, um, and it even also reduces their wood chip demand because it is a condensing boiler and it condenses better at lower temperatures. And maybe also for district heating specifically, you can see that their transport losses go down by thirty percent. So for district heating, there's an, a lot of side benefits of lowering flow temperatures, um, which mainly is lowering transport losses, which can be really significant, especially in older and less insulated systems, uh, of which there are unfortunately quite a few, especially in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but also it means you can use cheaper components in your district heating system, for example, at lower flow temperatures, you could use plastic pipes instead of steel pipes, which of course lowers the cost. Um, it also increases the thermal storage capacity. Uh, it lowers wear and tear, um, which also applies actually to your boiler and, and the heating system at home. So your radiators will corrode uh, less quickly at lower temperatures. Um, and also, it, especially for district heat that operates at very high temperatures, it will lead to more safety, especially for people doing the maintenance. So there's this whole range of benefits that we get from operating this, uh, heating systems at lower flow temperatures. Then, of course, the obvious question is, why are we not already doing this? Um, well, in, in many cases with existing uh, condensing gas boilers, people might be unaware um, or have never really uh, done a good analysis of their home and uh, looked at, okay, what are the optimal temperatures to heat my home with? Um, but they instead just used the standard settings that come with the boiler. Um, 
But in many cases also, of course, buildings need to be able to operate at these lower flow temperatures, um, as we still want to be able to heat our home comfortably when we lower the temperature. And there's basically two variables that you can adapt to make this happen. On the one side, it can be improving the building envelope. Um, as we improve the envelope, this reduces the heat loss and this also the heat demand that we have, which um, would lead to the emitters that are in the building, the radiators, to be oversized uh, for the building as they were designed for a building with higher heat loss, which means that you can now lower the flow temperature. On the other hand, you can also increase the size of the emitters um, because when you lower the temperature, the amount of heat uh, transferred to the room goes down. So to compensate for that, you might need to increase the size or the thickness of the radiators in the home. Um, so now we've looked at why low flow is important and really briefly at how this can be done. And of course, there's a lot of you know, practical barriers and, and technical solutions on how to do this. Um, I think for this presentation, it goes too far to really go into that. But if that's really interesting to you, then um, I'm happy to uh, share the study with you once it comes out, where we describe in much more detail how you can also achieve this, this uh, low flow readiness in uh, homes. Um, but to make sure we also still have some time for discussion, I just have a few final slides more on the implementation of low flow readiness. Um, and we have done a short inventory of policies that different member states have already implemented uh, or could implement uh, that in, in some way relate to low flow temperatures. And I would also be really keen to know um, if there's any examples in your countries or regions um, where you have seen policies that relate to lowering flow temperatures, um, or also know about sort of what barriers you think there are in your specific policy context. Um, so looking briefly at the implementation of low flow readiness, uh, I've tried to make an inventory of all the examples we could find. Um, but as this is a relatively new concept there, yeah, there has not been a lot of policy made on this, uh, but in general, we found sort of four different categories of policies that can be used to drive low flow readiness in buildings. Um, on the one end, it would be through building codes, although this is mainly relevant for new, new buildings. Um, for example, setting a requirement that all new heating systems run at a specific temperature, um, maybe 55 degrees and lower in the case of district heating. Um, and for heat pumps, you could go even lower, for example, to 45 degrees. Um, but for existing buildings, we would need, for example, uh, renovation standards, which would have a much wider impact. Um, and of these, we have found one example, which I will go into more detail later uh, in the Netherlands, which is um, a nationally defined and regulated standard, um, but also something like uh, mandatory energy performance standards that have been discussed as part of the EPBD recast. Uh, could fall into this. And then another way that we've seen uh, countries do this is using uh, funding programs. So for example, connecting funding for heat pump installation to uh, a specific temperature saying, okay, you will only get a grant for a heat pump if your heating system can run at a specific uh, flow temperature. And finally, several countries um, have also implemented policies around information, engagement, and audits, uh, including, for example, um, a metric in the energy performance certificate that can show whether your home is ready or not to be heated with lower flow temperatures, uh, but also included maybe in energy audits. So for example, in Germany, um, when there, where there's an obligatory um, check of your boiler, the technician will not also check, okay, is it running at the right temperature? Can I lower the temperature? And if not, what changes can be made to the heating system to enable these lower temperatures? And also in several countries, uh, there have been campaigns, uh, especially in response to the fossil gas crisis, um, to encourage people to check whether they can lower their flow temperatures and still heat comfortably. Um, so going maybe a bit deeper in one example in the Netherlands, 
um, in 2021, they introduced a national home insulation standard as part of its broad set of policies aimed at moving away from fossil gas in the built environment. And this is a non-obligatory standard, but it really um, provides um, homeowners and inhabitants a sort of an indication of when the energy performance of their home should be good enough to make the switch from natural gas to a clean heating source. So the idea is that whatever the future heating source the home uh, will receive, which will depend on the municipal heat planning, uh, the home will be ready for it, and it does not need to undergo any additional works. Um, so it does not directly mandate lower flow temperatures, but in practice, if you follow the standard, it means that lower flow temperatures are possible, um, especially for post-war buildings. For older buildings, uh, they set the standard at a level that does not yet allow lower flow temperatures, but with bigger radiator changes that could still uh, be possible. So they are really trying to balance sort of cost and feasibility of implementation um, and provide people with a clear indicator of when their home would be ready to be heated with lower flow temperatures. Um, so this was just a really short introduction into the concept. Um, I hope we still have some time left for questions. I see that I might have been speaking for longer already than planned. Um, because I would be very keen uh, to know what sort of challenges you see in your areas to move to lower flow temperatures in buildings. And also if you have any further examples um, of policy instruments that we could include. Um, and for if you're interested in more details, feel free to reach out to me. I can also share the studies uh, maybe that can go through Svetoslav when the study is ready. I can send it to him and then he can share it as well. Uh, thanks a lot and looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam. We have uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, they're not really policy related, but uh, a little bit more on the practical side. Uh, so uh, we have a, we're going to start uh, with a question from uh, Facebook, Atanas Stoikov, and he is asking, uh, for the case of a low temperature heat carrier in district heating, um, approximately 60 degrees Celsius, uh, how is the problem with uh, uh, the danger of le Legionella bacteria solved? Um, yes, yeah, something something that we are discussing quite a lot of in HVAC circles. Yes, so I am not an engineer, but in the the if the so our partners in the project if you have been looking at looking at this because the the Janella requirements in Germany are very strict um and so the solution I think very much depends on on how the hot water is generated right now um and whether it's generated for each apartment or for the whole building in one go um but as um I think the most frequently used um, solution for this would be to have the um, a, a short sort of boost heater at the building level or apartment level um, for the hot water provision. Um, so that would be the, the easiest change to the system. But I know that they are also looking into different filtering systems. Um, and in the case of non-district heating, uh, the Legionella risk is only really there if you have a boiler. So um, if you really preheat the water and let it sit in a tank for a long while, or you have very long pipes. Um, but in the case of just a gas boiler that heats your uh, water immediately before use, then this Legionella risk is very, very low. Um, so yeah, they they looked extensively at this. And um, I cannot give you all the technical details, but in the paper, we describe it. Uh, how that can be done. But yeah, thank you, question. Sam. Uh, uh, Gennady. Yeah, thanks for the stuff. Thanks, Sam. Uh, <clears throat> just wanted to say that um, Legionella basically uh, gets killed at 60 degrees. Actually, 55, I think, are normally considered sufficient. Um, and I've been part of projects for renewable um, uh, heating for domestic hot water, uh, where specifically for the periods where <laughs> there's not enough solar um heat the there electric there is electrical um 
uh, heating, electrical heaters that are installed in the water tanks so that they can heat the water every, I believe it was like two weeks to 65 degrees so that they can kill the, uh, the, the bacteria and the sediments of bacteria and that they can keep the, the tanks disease free. But for the for this uh, medium uh, temperature, um, 60 degrees is sufficient so that uh, it does prevent the development of Legionella. Yes, thank you for for that, Jenny. And I know that many heat pumps also uh, do this automatically, so they have an automatic cycle. For ex for example, every two weeks, or this really differs per country depending on the regulations. They automatically, for a certain period of time, heat to uh, 60 degrees or whatever temperature specified, that is enough to kill the, the growth. And thank you. We have two more uh, two more questions that I can see. And um, um, you talked um, a lot about gas heating and district heating, but uh, is it the same for wood central heating, uh, pellet boilers? Uh, because these uh, technologies are quite prevalent in, in Bulgaria for individual houses. So is it is it the same? Could we do the same easily when we have uh, wood central heating in our home? Ooh, good question. And again, <laughs> I'm not the best person to answer as I'm are looking at policies, but um, it depends if it's a condensing boiler or not, I would say, because in in combustion the main benefit comes from the heat recovery from the flue gases so if your wood boiler has uh yeah re re heat recovery from condensation then uh, you could benefit from lowering um flow temperatures and return temperatures um but i think this benefit could be less than um uh, yeah with other fuels um and in district heat I know that from the, um, there's this big study from the International Energy Agency on uh, low um, low temperature district heating. And there they do say that also biomass or biogas CHP can benefit from lower flow temperatures. It's just not as much maybe as the benefit you would get for uh, ambient heat or, um, or heat pumps. And there is, uh, thank you, there is uh, one more question, the final one, and it is, uh, do we need to replace our uh, existing heating installation in our homes in order to reap the benefits of low lowering the flow uh, temperatures? And uh, you mentioned that um, increasing, uh, that we should increase the size of the radiators in order of uh, the system to be more uh, efficient, and how cost uh, how costly is that and is it really cost efficient to do so well so this is very hard to say because this will really depend on your situation so for example in the netherlands they looked into this and they found that 60 percent of the homes are already uh, low flow temperature ready right now just because in the past um the heating systems were usually desi designed to be oversized uh just to be be uh, because people were conservative and they wanted to make sure that the home would heat properly and maybe because the methods weren't as precise. And then added to that, many homes might have had already a single renovation measure, like for example, new windows or roof insulation. So, um, but the heating system was designed for the original situation. So this would mean that there is already some oversizing in the heating system in many cases. Um, and in these cases, it would be, yeah, relatively easy to lower your temperatures. Um, but so this really depends on the individual, yeah, on the basis of what you have available right now. Um, and in other cases, it could be that there's may, might be only one or two radiators in the system that are sort of the weakest link. I think in the, the case of the district heating system in Germany, they identified that often the radiator in the in the bathroom, for example, was too small. And so by just changing that radiator, it allowed them to lower the flow temperatures. Um, but in other cases, like for example, in my own apartment, where they really undersized the, district, the, the heating system, I will have to like really go for much thicker and much larger radiators and maybe even include uh, fans when I want to go to a really low temperature for a heat pump. Um, 
and it, it's not always necessary but it just makes it more efficient um because i mean in principle right now we have a lot of heat pumps that can heat at higher temperatures uh it's just that you will use more electricity um so it is better to lower these temperatures um I would say the best would be to really do a heat loss calculation and then properly size the whole system on, on that basis. But I know that, yeah, many heat technicians still find that, you know, a lot of work and they rather just sort of size it according to all the rules of thumb they already have. Um, but so, yeah, it really depends on your current situation. But I would always, you know, there are some guides out there how you can try out uh, the already with your own system um and see whether your home is ready or not um to heat with lower flow temperatures hope that helps <laughs> question in the chat by raya lecheva um in bulgaria most of the uh dwellings uh many of the dwellings have uh district heating connection uh, i think this is actually about up to 19 percent between 15 and 19 percent of the households uh, so how to look up for uh, a sustainable heating solution there when it comes to district heating networks? Um, she believes that those are not the heat or you have, or are you on another opinion? Uh, and what has to be done at local um, uh, and municipal level uh, to um, uh, basically revamp, overhaul these uh, district heating networks? Uh, maybe here, if you know something about the economics of the large scale heat pumps, because these technologies are available um, and other hybrid solutions that you can tell us about. Um, yeah, good question. I mean, it's of course, you are more in the case of district heating system as an inhabitant or homeowner, you are more limited in what you can do yourself because um, it it's really related to the entire system. So I would say there it's crucial that you have this municipal heat planning um connected to also some sort of transformation plan for the district heating system because maybe even if your home uh, is well enough insulated to go to lower flow temperatures of course the whole district's heating system has to move in one go because they have to provide heating to all of the buildings so you would really need to start identifying okay which are the buildings in the system with the highest heat requirements and what can we do to uh, lower their heat demand and then at the same time, uh, you would need sort of the municipal heat planning to also start identifying what are the locally available clean heat sources um, and what are ways to lower the flow temperatures in the, um, in the system itself. So do we need to make any changes to the, to the distribution pipes or to the um, substations? Um, but so the benefits are really there especially because you're transporting heat over a longer distance so the lower the temperatures the lower the heat losses will be so it is really a good thing to do um and yeah as you say Janari, um large heat pumps um is something that would work very well um i think many systems will not be based purely on large heat pumps it will likely be a mix of sources but what we saw in our german case study is that um, when they are installing the heat pump, it means that they can lower the amount of, uh, in our case, biomass CHP they use. But in other cases, that might be a gas CHP or a coal boiler. So it might not, you might not be able to replace, you know, to fully decarbonize in one go. And I think, especially for district heating systems, since you will also always base backup. But the idea is okay, how can you maybe? at least not use it for base load anymore, but only start using it for peak load. Um, so I think, yeah, these are, um, the advantages are there, but maybe for you as a homeowner, it's a bit more difficult to implement it by yourself and you really need this municipal uh, heat planning and a transformation plan for the whole district heating system. So good technical and cost assessment and good planning would be still the answer of this case. I would like to uh, to say that this topic will have its continuation on Friday when we have the entire session devoted to district heating networks. So um, stay with us. And uh, on Friday, we, we hope that uh, some of those questions will get their answers. Uh, we really had the hope that we will bring uh, a large heat pump manufacturer 
uh, during this uh, this event, but probably this will remain for next year because it was a very last minute invitation and we couldn't secure that. Still, Friday is the district heating session and there would be a few speakers that probably will also like to receive this question. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Sam, for your presentation. Uh, and now uh, we're going to continue with uh, Adrian Joyce. Adrian, I can see that you're available. Uh, so just a quick introduction. Uh, Adrian Joyce is uh, the director of Renovate Europe uh, campaign, which consists of 47 partners from all segments of the construction sector. And uh, he is the secretary general of uh, EuroACE, a European industry association, gathering 14 of the leading uh, product and equipment manufacturing companies in the construction sector. Uh, an architect by training with 18 years practice before taking up policy work in Brussels. Uh, he is a part-time professor of architecture at uh, Wuven Lagnoff in Belgium. And among other roles, he was uh, chair of the coalition for, for energy savings, which represents around 15 million uh, EU citizens through its members. Um, so uh, now Adrian is going to uh, talk about the building renovation in Central and Eastern Europe and uh, basically to give an over overview where are we now and uh, what uh, what happens next. Uh, so um, Adrian, now uh, the floor is yours and you can share your presentation. You're going to have approximately 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes including the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Svetoslav, um, and thank you for this invitation to uh, address this uh, session this morning. Delighted to be uh, talking to you and hoping that what I'm going to share with you is uh, of interest. Uh, indeed, thank you for um, stating my background. Um, uh, and I wanted to start by saying I really like the title of the, the, the session, Clean Energy for People. Um, but I do like to start by saying that uh, in our world, the cleanest energy is the energy we save, uh, hence our uh, focus on renovation. Uh, for the audience, it may still not be known, but across Europe as a whole, we uh, consume about 40% uh, of all uh, energy is consumed in our buildings, leading to 36% of greenhouse gas emissions. So in the EU as a whole, uh, addressing the building sector uh, remains an absolutely central uh, policy aim. And yet we're not seeing uh, the action on the ground. And uh, some of what I'll say will, will speak to that. I think it's also worth recalling that the construction sector overall as an ecosystem, it's now how we refer to it at European level, has an annual turnover in the EU of 1.4 trillion euro, representing more than 9% of GDP, and that it provides 25 million jobs in uh, over 3.5 million enterprises. This means that it's a very fragmented uh, sector, as most of those enterprises have less than 10 employees. So it's a challenging sector to address, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't ambitiously address the challenges. Then looking to the characteristics of the building stock across uh, the EU, and the Bulgarian uh, column is the first one on the left uh, of this uh, chart from BPIE in 2017. It showed at that time that the um, only about 3% of the entire building stock in the EU was classified as an efficient uh, building stock. So as you see in the chart, nearly everything is dark red or red with uh, maybe a fair bit of orange here and there, but very, very little green. And uh, <clears throat> this challenge was not addressed even by 2017, when a very important study was undertaken for the European Commission by Navigant. And it looked in great detail on a country by country basis at the rates of energy renovation across the uh, e European Union. And in it, it defined three uh, levels of energy renovation, shallow renovation, medium renovation, and deep renovation. It's worth saying that I would discount light renovation as energy related because it is 
uh, category for buildings that save between three and 29% of their energy per after the renovation works. It's only medium, which is between 30 and 59%, and particularly deep renovation, 60% and over, that really counts for uh, bringing our uh, climate and energy goals and that energy transition to a clean energy future uh, nearer. And when we look at the deep energy renovation rate across the European Union, we find that it's running at only 0.24% per annum. So quite a lot needs to be done. Even though at that rate, uh, these three categories of energy renovation were at that time, 2019, seeing approximately 200 billion euro being spent per year uh, on energy renovations. So in thinking about renovation works and thinking about programs that are needed across the EU and in the CEE region, I also like to say what approach is required to those programs. Well, in our understanding, it's essential to take a holistic approach, which means you address the energy loss first. We've just heard Sam's presentation speaking about the need for uh, reducing energy loss. Then install only highly efficient equipment with proper technical building systems that allow it to be controlled properly across its lifetime. And then exploit the other possibilities along the lines of digitalization and monitoring so that we can report on the performance after the works are completed and enter a continuously improving cycle of better and better renovations because we understand better and better what we've achieved with the previous schemes. Clearly, ensuring a quality outcome is super important because our credibility in the sector relies on a high quality outcome. So we advocate for the use of the best materials, the best available technology level, and a certified and expert installers who understand what their role is in the supply and value chain so that their work is uh, coordinated properly with all stages of the um, process. And in order to do that properly, pertinent, relevant, independent advice is needed and good financing solutions, which I want to come back to in a moment. Because here I want to digress slightly to say that with the current energy and security crisis that we see in Europe, we have seen that member states have been spending a great deal of money on uh, direct um, uh, subsidies to consumers. In fact, by the calculations of the Bruegel Institute here in Brussels, more than 650 billion euro has been spent by EU countries since September 21 so about 18 months ago, uh, just on direct subsidies and crisis measures to help us rightfully, we needed the help uh, for energy renovation. But compare that to the 250 billion or so additional uh, investment that's needed to really get the renovation wave and the renovation of our building stock underway. And you can see we've spent nearly three years of that money uh, just in subsidizing uh, energy consumption. So we have been calling that at the same time as supporting uh, the needed support for uh, communities and for people across the EU, more structural investment is needed uh, in parallel. So at the same then there's a little chart we've com com uh, com compiled here showing four Central Eastern European countries, the amount they have spent on those subsidies compared to how much they would have needed by 2030 to achieve their uh, medium term renovation targets. And you can see that significant percentages have been spent in each case, and uh, not always with the right measures being put into place uh, uh, in parallel. So I would, I, I do not intend to go down through this full chart because I'm coming back now to the policy issues. 
Uh, here I've listed uh, the main uh, policies that are affecting renovation, and uh, I'm very happy for the organizers to share my presentation after the event. But what I do want to dwell on is item number four, which has emerged out of the sequence prior to that, the Green Deal, the Fit for 55 package, uh, leading us to the revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Now that was published in December 2021, and today is still not fully negotiated between the uh, various institutions of the EU. In fact, it's been a directive that has led to a lot of um, the difficult political debate and uh, is, I would say at this point, stalled in its progress. And for us, this is a great pity because that uh, directive, the revision of it, will see the introduction of minimum energy performance standards. That is, member states will be required to devise them for their uh, context. It will give us a robust definition of deep renovation, meaning we can benchmark uh, schemes and pro projects against uh, uh, an EU-wide definition. And it would see an updating of the energy performance of certif certificate framework, which is a document that gives very good information uh, moving forward for uh, owners and businesses to understand what they need to do to their buildings to achieve our targets. Then I'm going to come back to the Repower EU package in just a moment. Um, but um, uh, Stevoslav already said who we are in the Renovate Europe campaign, but maybe what he didn't say is we're very grateful that we have a strong national partner in Renovate Bulgaria. Uh, it has been helping us a great deal with our information gathering around uh, what's happening in Bulgaria, and I understand has been active and well received uh, nationally. Um, we, he also didn't say that we've enjoyed great political support over the years since the campaign started in 2011, political support that we cherish and that we hope to increase uh, moving forward. So coming back then to the EU policy framework, I wanted to give a reminder on the renovation wave strategy because it was this strategy that led to the revision of the buildings directive. And here, the European Commission set the objectives of at least doubling medium and deep energy renovation rates by 2030. The, in doing so, they intend to uh, save energy, so actually implementing measures that reduce the consumption in our sector, which is precisely what we need, because there's the cleanest energy that we can have. And in doing so, we will alleviate energy poverty, create jobs, aid economic activity, and uh, bring benefits across uh, the across the board to everybody. So <clears throat> the specific targets are listed here. I would just uh, point out the deep renovation of 35 million building units, uh, which is a very ambitious one. Um, those of you who've been attentive would have seen we have about 200 million uh, buildings in the EU. So three, 35 million buildings renovated by 2030. Uh, that's just 17% of the stock, but still, that's uh, a good start, I would say, and if, uh, but I would say a minimum that we must achieve across the EU by that date. And in order to get there, an ambitious uh, energy performance of the buildings director is, in our view, really, really critical. But when we look at this challenge, uh, I would say that mobilization is the key word uh, across several different levels. So a technical and project development support level, uh, it's good for the audience to be aware that in DG reform, there is technical assistance available directly to local authorities, uh, to city authorities, to national authorities, and that there's an annual call for uh, requests for assistance that ends uh, on the 31st of October each year. But we need more from the financing side and EIB and ECB, the European Central Bank, are now becoming players uh, in helping on the facilitation of financing. But at national and local level, uh, one-stop shops, independent advice, 
uh, easy information is crucial. And again, a point I want to come back to. But not only at the policy level, but within the market, the whole value chain has got to get its act together. And so a lot more focus, we think, on in di di digitalization and industrialization of renovation through modular approaches. Recruitment of new, I would say, young talent is, is key. Upskilling of the existing workforce while they're in their careers. And new offers like the clustering of companies to give trusted quality um, uh, installations such as retrofit works in the UK are uh, approaches that we think are very valuable. But national governments have their responsibility. And I understand it's been difficult in Bulgaria recently with a political uncertainty uh, after the collapse of your government. I understand you still have a caretaker government making it difficult, but governments have the responsibility to put into place ambitious long-term renovation strategies to establishing nationally pertinent minimum energy performance uh, standard schemes, uh, implementing the recovery and resilience plans, to which I will come back, engaging with stakeholders to be sure that they are uh, doing the right thing and learning the right messages from the market. But the owners of buildings, we hope, will also feel motivated to comply with this uh, ambitious target because their own buildings will gain in value. Their own tenants, if they're landlords, will be happier. If you're a homeowner, you will be more productive and healthier in your home. And on the financing, um, we in, your, in Renovate Europe <clears throat> have worked to uh, map all of the financing that's available potentially for um, uh, building renovation. But before I show you quickly that, uh, that mapping, the Repower EU Action Plan, which came out last year, uh, was built on three pillars, bringing energy saving actions forward. So accelerating what we're doing in energy savings, diversifying energy supplies and boosting uh, renewable energy supply. So looking at the supply side, we think the emphasis is still too strong on the supply side, but fully understand the political sensitivities around it. There's an option for member states to add national repower EU plans to their national recovery and resilience plans. And funding for those action plans have been, has been sourced by repackaging existing funds. So let us see. I mean, in the repower EU, they asked for ambitious regulation in, uh, for buildings in the Energy Efficiency Directive. That's now achieved. And in the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, yet to be proven because the negotiations are still ongoing. So the EU funding that's available for all purposes amounts at the moment to around 1.9 trillion euro, of which about 625 billion must be spent on climate actions. But from our work, we find that less than 100 billion is going towards uh, energy renovation in this period 21 to 27. And just to point out, here's the repackaged Repower EU uh, funding. So no new funding came with it, uh, but here we've been able to map uh, what uh, existing funds have been used to create the Repower EU fund. So looking at renovation uh, across the CE region, I thought it might be best to, to quickly recall our work on uh, the National Recovery and Resilience Plans, which was updated in 2022. And when you receive the document, you have the hyperlinks here to those full studies running in one case to well over 150 pages. But what we found at the time was that renovation is a strong feature of the recovery and resilience plans, which I recall came because of the COVID crisis. We see uh, within the 18 member states that we studied uh, about a 40 billion euro uh, commitment to spend on, on energy renovation. That's about 67 billion when you include all member states. But we found significant variation. We found that residential sector takes the lead. And in most cases, it's only a 30% threshold that's required, which is below where we need to be. 
For the Bulgarian plan, we found that across our five criteria, it was the one that uh, across all of those criteria needs improvement. Even if there were several key aspects in the plan uh, that were good and well thought through. There are good examples in uh, mem member states. Um, looking here at the um, at the Central Eastern European country examples, we see in the Czech Republic that there's good adaptation, indoor environment requirements and use of sustainable materials. We find in Romania that National Di uh, Digital Building Register and Digital Building Renovation Passports and Logbooks are now required and are going to be funded. And in Croatia, one-stop shops were go are being established to uh, combine energy efficiency and earthquake uh, reconstruction, which for uh, Croatia was super important. A little deep dive into um, Bulgaria. Uh, in your plans, you've uh, earmarked 947 million euro for energy renovation. It's split largely uh, across um, residential buildings, uh, but with quite a, uh, a reasonable chunk going to public buildings and to industry. So you see that in the right hand pie chart. In the work, uh, in, the, in the plan rather, um, there are clear delivery milestones, but we found that they were not aligned to national targets in the long term renovation strategy, which is always a pity that there's not alignment across uh, different plans. And there's a need to improve the delivery using private capital. And that's a challenge, not just in Bulgaria, but I would say across uh, the region. Um, <clears throat> you have in your plan called for a use of energy efficiency audits to validate the actual savings realized in uh, non-domestic buildings. You have two projects on digitalization, which I see as a real uh, positive. And a real, a really important uh, element is a reform to pilot and scale up regional one-stop shops with funding from the national budget that would then give reliable, trusted information to building owners to move forward. Now, we're aware that in Bulgaria, your previous renovation program uh, saw the renovation to uh, a level C on the, in the energy performance certificate scale of about a thousand uh, multifamily buildings. Uh, uh, I would say a flagship project, though there were difficulties with it. And our hope is that your national uh, uh, renovation and resilience, uh, recovery and resilience plans will lead to a new program seeing thousands more of those buildings being brought to the same level of, of, um, of performance. In the update, we found that you've got your operational arrangements in place that were awaiting approval uh, by the commission, but we couldn't find out with our national partner whether the national milestones had been achieved uh, to date. In the presentation, when you see it later, we've included examples from a couple of other um, Central Eastern European countries. But I thought maybe a quick look at two examples that we have found uh, for our exhibition of how we can really uh, achieve high, high savings through holistic renovation. Uh, in Croatia, we found a kindergarten that has a 76% less energy consumption before, uh, uh, sorry, after renovation. And this work was carried out for a cost of approximately 375 euro per square meter, which for such a high energy saving looks really attractive uh, to us. And in Slovakia, 74% savings in a multifamily block that was, um, that I suppose is fairly typical of the kinds of buildings that exist across uh, the Central and Eastern European region. So from our perspective, huge potential in the Central and Eastern European region. Looking forward, we need an ambitious buildings directive that will incite uh, more coordination and more concerted effort uh, in this field. And having a private finance mobilized and one-stop shops available for building owners is crucially important. I have two short additional points I wanted to make uh, on skills. 
we did a little mini um, mini uh, project uh, with two briefings, one on advisory services and one-stop shops uh, and one on skills from October of last year. I think both worth looking at, but on the skills side, we found in fact in Bulgaria of a possible eight types of training for energy renovation. We only found two are in existence. So I'm afraid that's not great. It would be good to uh, upscale that. And on uh, advisory services, as you see, zero across the board, but in your national recovery and resilience plans, that's there. And my very last word is to say, I hope to meet many of you at the C4E Forum in Slovakia, which Renovate Europe is co-organizing this year with Buildings for the Future, our national partner. It's going to be super exciting. We've got great content and I, I will really look forward to meeting you in person there. So uh, Svetoslav, with that, I thank you for the attention and I'm ready to take any questions uh, from the audience in the hope that I can answer them. So I will stop the presentation and, uh, and uh, take some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for the presentation. Uh, we have uh, actually quite a lot of questions. Maybe we can start with a, with a comment that I can see. Um, striking numbers of money spent on uh, for energy aid uh, versus the renovation needs. And uh, this shows how um, regretful we should be that we did not invest in a renovation in a more timely, uh, timely manner. And uh, um, can we still make the, the, needed, the needed jump in order to reach the renovation rates? Uh, this, is, this is the first, the first question. So with the comment, I can only agree. And we greatly regret it despite our efforts. I mean, this year, Eurowaste, where I'm Secretary General, is 25 years in existence. And we've been asking for this for 20 of those 25 years. Uh, so that's, uh, that is a regret that I share. Uh, the question, is it still feasible? The answer is yes, uh, and it is feasible with political will. I think all of us uh, never thought to live through a plague, but we did live through COVID, and we saw what member states and governments can do when there's a threat to their people. And uh, if we, in a sense, we could characterize the poor quality of buildings as a threat to our uh, health and our productivity. So cleaning up uh, our buildings through uh, deep energy renovation, I think ought to be seen as more of a societal challenge. Uh, I would like to think of energy renovation as a separate industrial activity so we can uh, incite creative and innovative new ways of uh, addressing the problem. And that can be done, as I hinted in my presentation, through um, through industrialization, uh, modular approaches, and in the Central Eastern European region, with all those multifamily buildings from uh, the 60s and 70s, this is a modular approach. So it should be very cost effective and very easy to scale up in your region. So it is feasible, but it's challenging. Thank you. And I see that uh, Gennady has raised his hand. Maybe he wants, uh, wants to add something. Just a few very quick things and a question. Um, uh, thank you really for raising also the topic of Repower EU and uh, uh, the coming updates on the Repower EU chapter. Obviously, Bulgaria is going to be late, but I hope that the other C countries will not. Also, strongly recommend to everyone the C4E forum. Unfortunately, I won't be able to join this year, but I hope the, the colleagues will be there. It's a fantastic event that already has such a long tradition. Um, and one thing is to consider in your research, uh, because we really don't have the structured picture country by country, especially a uh, problem that varies uh, also here in Central and Eastern Europe and in Southeast uh, Europe, is the depopulation of buildings, because we say that we should invest in those multifamily buildings, but there are issues about um, on one hand, how long they are going to be inhabited, and on the other hand, that there's already a drift away from those buildings by uh, by so many uh, citizens, by the shrinking population, uh, also as a result of the shrinking population in those countries. It seems that this is not a problem everywhere, because I've been talking to colleagues in Poland, and they say we absolutely don't have this problem. 
but it is a huge problem in Bulgaria. And we were even planning for a, a debate um, during this conference, uh, but unfortunately the results from the last census in Bulgaria are not available just yet. The one from 2011 was already hinting of something like 30% of the dwellings not being inhabited. This is not the precise number because some people simply rent out their apartments without a contract. So sort of a gray market for this, but um, it is still a very, very significant number and it should be taken um, as a problem into the entire picture. And my question actually um, is um, how should we feel about um, the moments in the areas that you say in the policy uh, work are currently stalled? Um, what is the risk related to the upcoming European elections? What we need to push so that it happens um, as process and uh, gets concluded before the next round of European elections, uh, because it may slip away or in the worst case scenario, probably even get rolled back by the next European Commission um, and institutions, the way they would be structured. Thanks for the comments, Gennady. Interesting to hear that about Bulgaria and the depopulation of buildings. But coming to your actual question, um, the situation today on the negotiations is not very clear. Unfortunately, the presidencies are, uh, Swedish presidency and the incoming Spanish presidency are not talking about the buildings directive as a key dossier for them. So from a Bulgarian perspective, in fact, every member state, in my view, ought to be speaking up saying that, uh, and, and rather than going down to this directive, which is seen as highly technical, saying the fit for 55 package is not yet complete because the buildings directive is not finalized put effort into finalizing it so we have a coherent full package of legislation so that all uh, stakeholders and all national governments can see clearly what their what their commitments are what their requirements for action are because without the completion of the package there's a, a key central element that's not uh, not regulated or not regulated at the level needed and if actors in bulgaria can put pressure on uh, the ministries because i guess it's only there for the time being not the ministers uh, to speak to the presidencies directly asking for completion of the fit for 55 package so that they have clarity nationally that would be very helpful already so not going into the details of the dossier, but simply calling for its uh, its completion to finalize Fit for 55. I think that's the best message at this point. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Adrian. You. Thank you, Gennady. Uh, we have actually two more uh, two more questions, maybe very briefly. Uh, what is the real importance of the minimum energy performance standard scheme? Uh, yeah, this is this is the this is the one of the question. And another question is kind of the same, but for the one-stop shops. And how? Um, what is the likely role one-stop shops are going to going to play? And what is the likely role that uh, they are going to be structured? What is the model that you are supposing that they are going to to take? Okay. They're, they're big questions, but let me take the second one first. Uh, on one-stop shops, uh, there are a number of models across Europe that can be pointed to, and we have uh, brought those into our report that I referred to from October of 2022, uh, in which we talk about the services that can and should be supplied through one-stop shops. But in a nutshell, a one-stop shop is an independent, trustworthy place where you as a home or building owner can go and be accompanied through the full process from initial planning, decision-taking, construction, and maintenance of your, uh, of your building. So uh, hand-holding, if you like, throughout the entire process to take away the stress and take away the uncertainty about uh, embarking on an energy renovation project. And if uh, participants would look at the Retrofit Works website, there's a really good explanation about what a good one-stop shop does. In that particular case, it's a privately owned uh, uh, initiative, but we have seen that there are models of privately owned, publicly owned, or private public. Uh, so all three models are possible. I'm not sure what would suit best in Bulgaria. 
and our minimum energy performance standards, the um, properly designed minimum energy performance standards will, and that's the key point, will alleviate uh, the, the, the hardship for the most vulnerable and most energy poor in society. Because all the policymakers uh, and all the advocates are saying that with minimum energy performance standards, they should be designed to address the worst performing buildings first, and to do so through a largely um, grant aided or zero cost approach. And to have minimum energy performance standards that are tailored for each segment of the building stock with measures that allow every socioeconomic group to benefit, but starting with the worst off in society. So properly designed minimum energy performance standards will see the European Union and the building stock getting uh, all of the getting all of the buildings uh, sorry capturing the potential of buildings for our medium and long term energy and climate uh, targets and we'll see those benefits I spoke about being uh, being felt by people quicker so. We think it's the instrument that's needed, uh, but it must be brought in with the enabling framework of one-stop shops, the right kind of financing across socioeconomic groups as a package. So a good scheme will be a good package. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I don't see um, any other questions in our um, from our public. Uh, so thank you again for the presentation and uh, and the discussion. And now we're going to uh, continue with a discussion panel. Thank you again, Adrian. Um, consisting of uh, we're going to continue this discussion uh, about building renovation and what are um, the actually the um, um, what is going in three different uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries. We're going to speak about Bulgaria. Uh, Estonia and uh, and Latvia and uh, we have uh, uh, Lilia up in here from Green uh, Liberty Latvia and uh, she's an energy transformation campaigner um, as well as uh, in uh, the Latvian NGO Green Liberty as well as the C Bank Watch Network and her work revolves around promotion of energy efficiency uh, renewables uh, making sure public funding is directed towards reaching climate neutrality uh, we have uh, Wauri uh, Su, um, who is an energy efficiency specialist uh, and who has worked as an apartment building grant manager and head of housing policy of the Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. And currently he is leading the Life IP Buildest project. Uh, so hello, uh, Lauri. And uh, finally, we have uh, Dragomir Zanev from, uh, from Bulgaria. And uh, he is the executive director of, uh, of the Center of Energy Efficiency, NFEC, and official representative of Municipal Energy Efficiency Network, Eco Energy in Bulgaria. Uh, and um, just uh, just a quick question uh, to uh, to all of you. Uh, you heard, and of course you know what is happening on the uh, on the European level at large and um, what is happening in uh, Central and uh, Eastern Europe. But I would really like to see, uh, uh, to hear from you, what are the bottlenecks in every single country? What are the most important issues that we need to solve in order to uh, ramp up the, the building renovation, uh, not only in multifamily buildings, but in single family buildings too. So um, whoever wants to start first, you can go maybe maybe Lilia, you can start. Uh, we cannot hear you, uh, at least I cannot. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Great. I don't know what's what's up with these headphones. <laughs> Okay, so uh, surprisingly, the main bottleneck is not the lack of funding. Uh, although uh, we would instinctively feel that we need to have more funding for the renovation and uh, that is uh, how uh, we will solve these issues. But currently, this is not the case in Latvia because we see that uh, the funding is there, but uh, uh, there's uh, 
the application rate is rather rather slow. Uh, it could be much higher, and uh, and obviously, if it would be more higher, then we wouldn't need extra funding in uh, ideal circumstances. But that's not the case. And so, when we go deeper into understanding why citizens are not applying uh, and why there are some high such high rate dropout projects as well, is that uh, uh, we we come across uh, uh, several factors. We see that. For instance, when we see uh, look at the municipalities which have the highest runaway share of renovated buildings, we see that these municipalities have been proactive with uh, supporting citizens, with uh, meeting with uh, these uh, uh, multi-apartment housing associations, with explaining them, with helping them understand uh, why is this necessary, and and explaining why. Uh, basically addressing these psychological barriers of uh, people being afraid, uh, taking up loans, uh, not understanding the process, thinking that, uh, you know, the building quality is low, there's something will go wrong, you know, there are always these examples of how something did went wrong, did go wrong, and um, so we see that there is a need to, uh, to really guide certain houses, of course, and, and we see these buildings where renovation has taken place, we also see that there's always an active inhabitant, at least one, who has the time, who has intellectual capacity to understand and to really invest their energy and time persuading their neighbors and uh, so they can really decide on starting the renovation. But there are a lot of buildings which do, simply do not have these leaders and it's uh, understandable. Uh, buildings which might have higher rates of lower income, uh, inhabitants which have um, a more high rate of retired people. Uh, these are the ones that are struggling the most because uh, understandably, psychologically, we, we see that, of course, they their motivation is lower and they have higher fears. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of work needs to be done to, to persuade, to explain, and not just one meeting, uh, several meetings. And um, so what we see as a solution is that we, we cannot, uh, of course, these, the lowest hanging fruits has been either taken already or are soon to be taken. Uh, but we need to move forward to these buildings, which, and, and if we want to address uh, energy poverty, then this is exactly what, what we we want to go there. We want to go to these buildings, which are which have low income families, uh, retired people. And uh, so we cannot just leave it by, by chance. And, and and leave this well eventually they will come around and uh, of course we need uh incentives that will be provided by mandatory energy performance standards and um and the certain outcomes which uh will come if if there is if a certain standard is not met in a certain period uh but that would be you know a last resort i think uh therefore what we are advocating and, and we think that what this would be really useful in Latvia would be to have a more active role for municipalities. Uh, and um, so we don't see that just putting more funding in the existing existing renovation programs will help. We see that the funding needs to be uh, used uh, for, for reforms, for transformational uh, measures, uh, providing uh, program managers for specific buildings, which simply do, do, do not have that kind of capacity, or providing more funding to municipalities that can, uh, so they can afford uh, to actually do this work, do this intensive work of explaining and guiding people throughout this application process and not dropping out. Uh, recently, legislation has changed um, in a really good way uh, uh, regarding the voting. Now we need to have only. 51% of residents saying yes to do the renovation, which is really good. But then if you do have like 51 or 52% only, there's really high risk of dropping out somewhere along the way because someone might get scared, might get scared by something, might hear some news somewhere and they just uh, at some critical point might change their thoughts and, and, and therefore there's this dropout project. Um, yes, so this is... And this is what we see right now is really lacking. Also, uh, the problem is that there's uh, the funding is really interrupted. There's not a continuous funding uh, available at any time. It, it is really dependent on EU funds. Uh, right now, there's an ongoing program from the recovery plan. 
um, <clears throat> all seems to be good. Well, except maybe so a few aspects like uh, not doing deep renovations. Uh, Latvia does not choose this path, unfortunately. They choose to have uh, uh, lower targets, uh, say, stating that uh, this is what uh, inhabitants can afford. But of course, we need to think long term. Um, uh, yes, so this continuous funding issue is also something that really needs to be solved. But uh, that's again, um, and also and the programs which are more diverse because we have a unified one program, uh, but we see that not everyone fits this program, not everyone is reached by this, and uh, therefore we would want to see more uh, elaborated programs for low-income families, which I hope will be developed from the cohesion fam uh, policy, uh, but we don't know don't know yet. Uh, but all that also. <laughs> Comes down to the fact that uh, this uh, authority managing this Altum uh, in Latvia, it's called, uh, simply does not have enough enough capacity, and that's uh, a political issue. Basically, not wanting to have uh, to uh, spend too much on the employees, and uh, but this is, uh, uh, I see another bottleneck, uh, and maybe you know, a capacity building, uh, uh, capacity capacity improvement from this uh, authority would really bring bring the needed uh, renovation wave, which we really long for. Thank you. Thank you, Lilia. Uh, I can see a lot of similarities of what is happening in Latvia and what, what is happening in Bulgaria, actually. I don't know how, what is the situation in Estonia. Uh, maybe, maybe Dragomir, you can, you can just um, summarize what we have spoken so many times about the problems uh, in Bulgaria. And do you see the similarities and do you see something something different happening in Latvia and in Bulgaria? Yep. Uh, thank, thank you, Svetosov, and thanks for the invitation. Also, thanks to uh, to Adrian for uh, a very, I would say, uh, first comprehensive and then quite diplomatic assessment of the situation in Bulgaria. And uh, then thanks to Lilia for pointing out most of the arguments that are absolutely valid for Bulgaria. It's, uh, yeah, while well, listening to her, I was finding out uh, just my immediate reaction. Yes, that's absolutely the same here. It's absolutely the same that uh, municipalities that are proactive, they're getting uh, the bunch, the big, uh, the, the big bunch of uh, renovation projects. They're attracting the financing. They're reaping the benefits of renovation, and uh, the local communities understand why it is so important and was so beneficial for them to get uh, involved. But it's also a fact that many of the other factors that are promoting the renovation process are missing, especially at the national level. So my overview of the project is that it is a systematic issue. And like every system, if one of the components of the system is not operating properly, so we cannot expect that the system will work properly. And this needs a lot of coordination, interinstitutional coordination at national levels. And this is where we face the biggest issues. Yes, of course, our situation in Bulgaria is uh, very problematic, but it doesn't start from now. It's the situation that we have for many, many years uh, as regards the housing policies in general and energy efficiency policies uh, as uh, a particularity in the overall uh housing policies uh, in the country so the fact is that we still are not capable to coordinate between the different uh, political targets and investment lines in order to channel them in the object of the policies the buildings to achieve the best possible results in the most economically feasible feasible manner and if you ask me about uh, the one thing that I should point out as uh, uh, the main problem, well, again, as I said, it's a system. All components have to work together. But without the gluing component, component of political will, it's not going to happen because the political need is important to do the regulations properly, to do the financing instruments properly, to match them into cohesive programs and to provide the certifications, the, the quality assurance, the training and education, the communication that uh, is missing uh, from our market. So basically, if we are able to influence in a more convincing way the national 
policy and decision makers at the administrative level of the institutions uh, that they have to collaborate more and that they have to unite around this societal value of maintaining a properly functioning building stock. I think we should be on the right way. And so this is what actually our advocacy efforts together with the uh, Zemata, together with other partners in Bulgaria are targeted for uh, to make the case of how important it is to really understand the building stock as a national value and to uh, to try to, let's say, be more responsible towards it. Because, yes, in our short term political visions and on our term, on, uh, on our uh, how should I say, urge to find populistic motives in our campaigning, we forget that actually people love their buildings. And the one that is able to help them, renovate them, and keep them in a proper condition would uh, really, uh, really uh, attract the attention. But it needs time, it needs determination, it needs continuity, it needs us to change that uh, inappropriate manner of investing in renovation only and when only when uh certain funds comes from somewhere fall from the sky spacing so so that's it and of course i'm happy to delve into all of these parts of the system that i tried to uh, you know just briefly mention so that we see what are the best practices in the region and how we can benefit from them exchange a little bit more on regional level and import best practices from other countries around Uh, thank you, thank you, Drago. And uh, now we're going to Estonia and to and to uh, Lauri. And basically, the the question is the same: What are the bottlenecks that you can see? But maybe we can just uh, um, take another element uh, and uh, ask basically: uh, what, is, what is the one thing that you could change if you could in the system? Uh, yes, uh, hello. Um, I think what Lilia mentioned uh, at last is the, what we call it sustainable funding is the key issue. Uh, and uh, why is that? Because um, even though, let's imagine that uh, we have all, all the money we have to, to boost up the demand in that side, then uh, we also need supply side. And the supply side is one thing that uh, it doesn't get as much as intention, uh, attention as the demand side. And uh, this is uh, problematic because uh, we can um, uh, scale up the demand side or, or, or change the demand side quite quickly compared to the supply side. So even if the system is established and uh, working like uh, we have in Estonia, that uh, there is demand side uh, averagely. Of course, there are regions where it, uh, th there are disparities between the regions, but on averagely, all, all, all and all, there is demand side. We see that the bottlenecks will be the supply side and the sustainable funding is uh, guaranteeing that, uh, the, for example, the building companies or, or, or other consulting companies who do the project designs, so do the supervisory, et cetera, et cetera, will uh, slowly shift from new building to the renovation sector. But they don't do that uh, before they know that uh, there will be enough demand for five, 10, or, or even, even further. So th probably this, uh, this is the key element. And um, when you ask, is there like something new to add? Uh, maybe uh, this kind of uh, R&D or research development project or, or pilot projects, uh, let's put them uh, all in on, 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 under, under one roof or umbrella, is that uh, how many Western or Central countries are dealing with this uh, uh, consulting or, or this uh, capacity building is uh, they, they're doing it project by project. So they're applying some kind of uh, uh, European project. For example, we have this uh, Life IP builders, but they're going to be Interreg or, or, or whatever your European tunnel there is for project. And during that project, they start to apply for another project. 
and uh, so they can like establish this kind of uh, consulting uh, part or, or, or can cover their uh, personal cost or, or whatever one-stop shop developments or this kind of uh, software activities under this kind of scheme. Uh, and uh, many of these European uh, projects, uh, you can also do the piloting thing, what is really important. Uh, you have the technical solution or, or even the approach, for example, neighborhood approach or this prefabricated panel approach, what we are piloting now. And then you can play all the things under this piloting and do the, all the mistakes, basically, uh, then. And then you learn from it and then you have the answer, can we scale it up? How much can we scale it up? What type of buildings? What type of uh, approaches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, of course, uh, what uh, Dragomar said, you have all, all the components have to be in place. If, if there is lack of regu regular or, or in the laws, you can, uh, you can do as much as piloting, but uh, when you can't scale it up because of the barriers of the laws, then it's also pointless. So all the pieces have to be together. Thank you. And uh, I just uh, wanted to ask one question because uh, before I give the word to the others, uh, but could you tell us a little bit of, uh, more about this prefabricated panel approach that you are piloting in Estonia, um, just, just to get to know the details and if we could actually transfer it to another countries from the ex-Soviet bloc, probably. Uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, well, what we believe, this is the one of the, how to say, one of the best options how to scale it up, this mass uh, renovation. Um, so um, uh, we have uh, now completed, I think, uh, three or four buildings. Uh, years ago, the Tallinn University of Technology renovated their dormitory. So uh, it, it's not very comparable to the average apartment uh, buildings where people are living in. They could like, uh, uh, let's say, play all, with all the detail, technical details. But uh, after that, uh, I think last year, uh, um, the first uh, apartment uh, buildings were renovated were 24 or 18 apartments, something like that. And uh, after that, uh, we decided to open up this pilot uh, program uh, where about 20 uh, apartment buildings with different type of uh, typology uh, is, is, will be renovated. And there, yeah, I think two is now ready and most of them will be renovated this year and probably uh, the, the, the 20 will be finished uh, end, of, uh, end of next year. So um, the, the idea of it, uh, of course, as Estonia, um, I don't know, is or was uh, the largest uh, exporter of uh, wooden houses. We have the knowledge and capacity uh, to use wood as, uh, to build this, uh, these panels. But ba basically, uh, you, you, uh, you build a prefabricated insulation panel in the controlled environment in the factory. You uh, install there all windows, all uh, ventilation ducts, uh, whatever is needed. And then you basically glue them or uh, attach them uh, on the wall. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, ideally this process would take maybe a couple of weeks instead of months under the scoff uh, scaffolds and so on, especially in the, this Nordic uh, climate where where there is a lot of rain, a lot of snow, and uh, when you when you do that or you you produce this kind of panels in the control environment, the quality of them is absolutely different. And when the quality is different, uh, it means that you don't have to be renovating this building probably not before forty or fifty years. And that leads to the other side, which is the, probably the financing side. So you can basically provide a loan with a maturity, not 20 years, which is like something average, but uh, over 30 or even 40 years. So that means that uh, you can do deep renovation, but the monthly payments for the apartment owner is, uh, is, is staying quite a reasonable level. 
Of course, we are not there yet to provide 40-year loans. And of course, there are a lot of risks regarding that. And uh, especially when maybe this building is in the area, which is uh, shrinking, something like that. So the value of the apartment will, will get lower and lower. But well, when you consider the whole uh, building stock, uh, I think most of the larger towns and cities uh, can be tower covering using te technology. And, and we see right now that the problem, the optimum level is something like three to five stories. Uh, we tried to pilot in a couple of nine story buildings also, but we already see there are some technical issues. Uh, so we will see how that pilot is going. Of course, now is the everybody is rising and uh, other, other things is in the market, which a bit uh, hindering uh, the process. Uh, but the, the, the first signals is that the, probably the five-story buildings is the most cost-effective uh, building, maybe 60 apartments, something like that is the, is the best. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the answer. I have, um, for quite a long time, I really wanted to ask uh, Dragomir if this uh, approach is applicable for Bulgaria and uh, what uh, what is his opinion basically on that because uh, uh, what we can see is that even in the renovated buildings we are um, mostly not reaching the energy savings or at least we are not measuring the energy savings that we are supposed to have uh, so supposed to have on paper on reality sometimes they are quite uh, quite a different uh, number so this is this is an issue for for bulgaria i don't know uh, if it's an issue for latvia or estonia but a prefabricated approach maybe it's the way to go in certain sense uh, what is your take on on this uh, issue drago it's definitely one of the ways to approach uh, the issue of uh, the performance gap uh, so yeah first of all i would like to absolutely uh, echo Lauri's uh, words, we need to invest in knowledge. We need to really provide a certain share of the financing programs to research, to knowledge, to piloting of different uh, technologies that have to be tested in the local uh, building, built environment with the local building traditions and, of course, integrating new technologies uh, into the renovation concepts. Uh, it's been more easy to do that in new buildings rather than uh, compared to the renovation, but uh, it's still still the renovations are a, pot a potential, uh, offer a very big market potential. Uh, so, yeah, it, there might be difficulties with prefab technologies in Bulgaria, for example, because the quality of the original construction is not good enough to apply directly prefabricated models. That's the thing that uh, the construction companies are saying. But... There are also product innovations that can cover the difficulties. And um, actually, the point is the predictability of the market. Because if you want to apply prefab technologies, that would lead me to the last sentence that Hadrian say, uh, you have to promote the concept of industrializing the renovation process. Precisely the words of Adrian. That would mean that you have to provide a predictable environment with continuous financial support and existing financial instruments for the construction companies and the producers to plan in long time their investments to deep to develop capacity so that they're sure that their initial investment is feasible in the long run this is not happening here actually the uh, the strategy the the, the the policies that we are uh, delivering at the national level are blocking such long-term investment because of precisely that unpredictability. On the other hand, we have also to help the policymakers by providing the pilot projects. In, indeed, talking about prefabs, we are involved in one project which is called Outfit, which is which is doing precisely that, uh, trying to pilot such uh, projects in the different European countries. And actually, I was just working over the Easter holidays on a new proposal uh, under Horizon Europe with Estonian partners, by the way, again, the University Technical University of Tallinn and TREA and uh, IBS, so that we really try to pilot zero emission building concept into renovation, single families and multifamilies. So uh, I would urge everybody really to try to invest efforts and the national policymakers to invest resources into research and education 
that is what is going to make the difference. And of course, all the communication uh, related to these pilots is also very important. Thank you, thank you, Dragomir. And uh, Lilia, what is your uh, what's your take on this situation? And just uh, we have to finish in probably around ten minutes. So just to to wrap uh, the things up, um, what is uh, basically your take on the situation? How we can improve uh, um, improve the renovation rate and the renovation quality of uh, of the building stock? Um. Well, first of all, we are. I'm. I'm quite excited to hear, to see how the Estonian uh, pilot project goes, and uh, I really think that there's a uh, great potential there because we see that the current approach, uh, one by one building, is rather slow, and uh, we we really have a huge challenge ahead uh, to decarbonize building stock, and we need to uh, implement projects like this. Also, I see. I'm very hopeful at uh, this approach where. Uh, the state manages the procurement for, for several type of buildings at the same time, as that is something the building industry uh, sees very favorably uh, because they're more interested in bigger projects. Um, that, and um, there's the limited uh, companies that work in the, in an in, in area where there's just one building, and because it's a considered smaller project, and that 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 is interesting. Um, Yes, and that this is something that Latvia is currently not doing yet. Uh, but uh, I know that uh, Latvian officials are also uh, interested in hearing out other examples of what is happening. And uh, I'm sure that, um, uh, you know, also all this energy crisis has uh, brought up again on the agenda this issue of building renovation. As we heard before, how much money we spent just on subsidizing energy bills and it's and and, be, and all of this because we haven't done our homework in the past 10 years. And uh, so I really hope that uh, this will keep on the agenda quite high and we will see uh, some solutions. There will be, need, we will need these solutions for funding really have this continuous funding, sustainable funding, which will, uh, like Laurie said, uh, solve this uh, supply side issue for sure. Um, I, I wanted to also add a bit on the uh, energy poverty issue and the uh, issue that, uh, uh, for instance, there's a lot of buildings uh, which are in need of renovation in Latvia, but which are not considered feasible to renovate. These are buildings uh, built uh, pre-war, uh, but uh, these are exactly you know where lower income families live. And uh, for them, it's uh, currently looks like they're being left out. Uh, of course, uh, officials say that the solution to this is building low rent, zero emission uh, buildings uh, where they could then move. Uh, but this policy is also not really being implemented, although everyone is eager to do that, but it's still somewhat uh, not happening really yet. And, um, and another issue is that these buildings are often of historical value, historical value. I would not want to see, for instance, turn down in Riga, these two story, uh, brick uh, uh, masonry buildings with a beautiful uh, wooden cladding, which is probably uh, from financial point of view, not feasible to renovate. But then again, we also need to take into account uh, other aspects such as, you know, aesthetic value of the city and which directly impacts our well-being as well. So this is something that uh, will also need to be addressed and maybe challenged. Uh, thank you, Lilia. Now I'm uh, giving uh, the floor for final words to Lauri and uh, Dragomir. So who, whoever wants to, to go first, it's more than welcome. Maybe uh, as uh, uh, last week uh, we had our, um, we had one uh, visit, study visit to Belgium uh, who has um, had a similar uh, life uh, project like we do now, the builders. They started in 2018 and will finish uh, next year. We started the last year and will finish 27. And uh, we visited, I think, five uh, five different regions and towns, and it was a uh, basically a be Belgian tour, not not uh, by bicycles but by, by bus. 
but but what we hear is that the problems are so similar. Uh, you you would think that maybe Western Europe has like uh, more capacity, but uh, the problems they struggle is is quite quite similar. That uh, there is no uh, willingness or capacity to do the deep renovation because of the income of uh, low income families, etc. There is no uh, not enough uh, qualified builders or or other specialists. There is not enough funding. Uh, so probably one stop shop. Uh, level is uh, is okay with uh, because they they really push push it uh, push it a lot and I think the last uh, EPBD text there was uh, the proposal the proposal that uh, every member state should have one stop shop for every forty or fifty thousand people so it uh, really like means that uh, these countries who, who doesn't have those one stop shop uh, have to have to develop and uh, develop them quite quickly and of course logical is to use the local municipalities uh, the the layer or or the place where, where it but 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 all in all yeah, just to like give on a give on maybe a twisted positive uh, positive outlook is that uh, we we are we are all in the same boat basically <laughs> So uh, don't don't worry, <laughs> we 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 tackle it uh, all together. And maybe a few words from myself. Uh, basically, what I'm thinking as of lately is that uh, you know, with uh, building renovation being such a complex issue, uh, you know, just the evidence is here from all the speakers. Uh, you saw different issues, different arguments that have to come together in an interplay fashion uh, so that uh, the process uh, start gaining depth, start gaining speed, started gaining rates that we want to see. I think the best uh, message that we can forward is that we need all to learn. We need to get more confident and better informed in all these components that are uh, coming together. And this is the only way that we can transform this uh, knowledge uh, in a convincing way to the stakeholders that are crucial for the decision making process uh, at uh, the national level. That includes the end uh, users. And uh, let's use such opportunities that we have like in these conferences really to increase our knowledge. For example, in the C4E forum, we will be coming with a group of five people from our organization. And I'm sure that there will be a very big Bulgarian group. And that's, that's really an excellent learning opportunity. It's also an excellent advocacy opportunity. Let's use these opportunity, opportunities to be more continuous in our message to policymakers at different levels. And so let's see the changes happening because there's no time. There's practically no time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dragomir. Uh, thank you, Lauri. Thank you, Lilia. With uh, this, we are just uh, closing uh, closing the discussion panel. Uh, I hope that the day uh, was helpful to our uh, audience. And tomorrow we are going to continue again at uh, nine uh, European uh, Central European time in the morning and uh, ten uh, local Bulgarian uh, time. And we're going to speak tomorrow um, about the best practices on energy efficiency and domestic heating uh, throughout uh, the, the region. Uh, so stay stay tuned. We're going to speak uh, also about the upskilling uh, of the construction sector. Uh, and uh, this is uh, going to be a, a presentation from Ira Ivanova, again from NFECT, from which I um, am thankful that she is also going to join. So uh, thank you again and uh, hopefully see you tomorrow.